He's rocked, he's shot, and he's been telling us to party like it's 1999 for 17 years. <laughs> the artist formerly known as Prince is our guest, a Music World original, next on Larry King Live. We're back in New York tonight. Never know where we are. Uh, this is our Millennium Month on Larry King Live. Tomorrow night, a tribute to Frank Sinatra. He, he would have been 84 years old this Sunday. We'll replay an interview tomorrow. And among the guests next week will be Ted Turner and Peter Jennings and Jim Carrey and President Gerald Ford and President Bill Clinton. That's all next week. It's a great pleasure to have with us tonight the artist formerly known as Prince. His first album in three years has just been released. It's called Rave Unto the Joy Fantastic. There you see the cover of the CD. And for the artist, the obvious first question is, why three years? Well, um, there's a few things I wanted to get out of my system, mainly uh, the uh, Crystal Ball Project, which was uh, uh, a reissue of a lot of the bootlegs that have been coming out all over the world. I'm probably one of the most bootlegged artists out there. I wanted to clean that up and get the real good mixes out and let people hear what they were really supposed to sound like, ever, if ever given the chance to complete them. So that's the reason for this space of time? Um, yeah, uh, we did a couple other projects. I was working with uh, Shaka Khan. I did an album with her, uh, uh, Larry Graham. Graham She's terrific. Did. Yeah. Well, she is. Did, did, what, can you, what can an artist do about bootlegging? Uh, what, the best thing you can do is uh, go back and get those mixes again and fix them up the way you always saw them uh, uh, completed and then, you know, reissue them. Do, do the, does the listener know if they buy one of these in Germany that this isn't what you intended? Um, a lot of my so-called fans do. And uh, they, uh, they actually thrive off the fact that it's stolen property. You, know. you, are, you would admit yourself an unusual personality. Well, it depends. I mean, well, let's say you're different. Um, as compared to what? As compared to most people in, let's say, show business, you're an unusual person. Mm -hmm. Most people don't get famous with one name and then change it. Mm -hmm. Right, would you say? What's the story of that, by the way? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, I had searched deep within my heart and spirit, and I wanted to uh, uh, make a change and move my life back home in my life, and one of the ways in which I did that was to change my name. It sort of divorced me from the past and all the hang-ups that were along with it. How was that? Uh, was it spelled out uh, chronically and uh, dis uh, distinct with uh, my record label? And then the other label, correct? Yeah. Which owns this network, I might add. Just oh, they do? Throw, yeah, what? Well, <laughs> they, um... We had some issues that were basically about ownership of the music and how often I was supposed to record and things like that. Uh, we got along otherwise. Uh, we just had uh, came to head uh, uh, at, and in those types of... Uh, so there was situations. no clash over what you would record or what kind of music you were singing, etc.? No. None no, of that? No, no creative issues whatsoever. And they were gracious enough to allow me uh, uh, very wide palette to, you know, put colors on to. But about the highest risk one would think someone who gets famous would take is to drop the name that got them famous. Well, um, that was one of the things that I dealt with is that uh, I really searched deep within to uh, find out the answer to whether fame was most important to me or uh, my spiritual well-being, and I chose the latter. Was it difficult? Um, to not be what you had become known as. Uh, you, you mean... I think, well, let's say a famous... Per the only other famous person I know who did this was Cassius Clay, who's a dear friend, and he changed his name to Muhammad Ali as heavyweight champion of the world. That was incredible to change your name. That was due to a faith belief. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't selling records. He was in the ring, and as long as he won, it sold. You, though, a uh, person in show business, is almost dependent on recognition. Mm -hmm. You stop being Prince. Well, I, that's a good point. I pretty much wanted to be dependent upon uh, God. And when you get the inner calling to 
do something and you know that you did it in spite of us all. You pretty much saw a one day answer that call and it has no consequences. Do you think this was God inspired as well? I, I do believe this. Why then did you choose the artist formerly known as? Well, I didn't choose that. That was chosen. It chosen for you. Yeah, pretty what much. What would you have chosen? Uh, I, I, I mean, did you think of a name? What is your name at birth? My name at birth was Prince Rogers Nelson. Yeah. So, did you think of Nelson? <laughs> no. <laughs> Rogers? No. Were you thinking of a name? No, it didn't come to me like that. So, how did the artist formerly known as come about? Well, that came up through people's uh, uh, problem with mainly the, the media's problem with not having a pronunciation for the symbol. So they had to come up with something, I guess. So the, the artist formerly known as is a media invention. Yes, sir. Not your invention. No, sir. You're a symbol. Oh. Okay, how do you promote a symbol? Well, um, what we found is uh, throughout, the, throughout the world, if you hold this up and show it to people what they think of, they will say Prince. Obviously. Yeah. So yeah. you obviously made it famous. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Can you tell us what it signifies? Well, me. <laughs> no, but I mean, how you chose it. You designed it? Um, it's sort of uh, come about over time. Uh, I've uh, always morphed the female and the male symbol together. Show it again. Let me see that. Yeah, and it works. It's pretty cool, ain't it? Makes for great jewelry, too. Has it been copied? Oh, yeah. Stores sell this everywhere? Uh, well, a lot of times you'll find, like I say, so called fans on the internet, which is uh, kind of a problem sometimes because once they use the symbol, it's as though I've endorsed whatever it is that they have uh, for sale. And uh, Can you copyright that? It is copyrighted. So you can't be ripped off by it? No. We've been showing it on the bottom of the screen so that people tune in, they know who we're watching oh, here. Oh, cool. All there right. it is. Look at that. See that? No, all right. That's it's cool, a, right? It's a class act. This thing, yeah, this, hey, this, right. this CNN man, we don't fool around. <laughs> we'll be right back with the artist formerly known as Prince. We're going to talk about his album, his extraordinary life. We'll be taking your phone calls as well. He's got a concert coming up. And the album, Rave Unto the Joy Fantastic, is now out. Don't bootleg it, buy it. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back with the artist, and the new album is Rave Unto, The Joy Fantastic. And he now calls himself the artist. In print, however, it is just a symbol. We gave him the name. He wanted to trace his early life, an incredible story. But you live in Spain, right? Uh, I, I like to say that I live in the world, but I'm not of it. I travel a lot. I call Spain home now. I also have a home in Minnesota. Yeah. Still in Minnesota. Yeah. Roots. Yeah. Why Spain? I, what I found um, that I like most is uh, from two to five, everything just shuts down. Uh, so siesta, fia siesta. Yeah. And everybody just chills, and they take a moment to just gather their senses. Uh, I think you know we probably need to do that here in America sometimes. That's so. No, what are you, at two o'clock every afternoon, you stop doing whatever you're doing. Well, there's uh, no stores and uh, uh, shopping and things like that. All that shuts down and just allows everybody a chance to just regroup and, you know, uh, think about life. Do you still have a fondness for Minneapolis? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what was it like growing up there? There aren't many blacks in Minneapolis. I was talking uh, to Dave Winfield the other night. That was about 1% maybe. Yeah. Um, it was interesting for me because I grew up... Uh, getting a wider array, uh, array of uh, music. Uh, I grew up with Santana and uh, Larry Graham and uh, Fleetwood Mac, all kinds of different things, you know. So uh, uh, that, that was very cool. Good place to grow up? Uh, yes, sir. Well, you had a rough childhood, didn't you? Um, in some respects. Did that affect your music? Mm, I don't think so. No. I, I think it probably helped me to look inside to know that I had to do for self. Yeah. You, you had a rough time with parents. I mean, that's all resolved now, but your father, you had a rough time with your father, right? I wouldn't call it rough. I mean, he was a uh, uh, very strict disciplinarian, but
but uh, all fathers were. Uh, I learned the difference between right and wrong, so I don't con I don't consider it uh, so rough. Would you look back and say you were glad he was that way? Well, you know, as I uh, go through this journey, I don't look back much at all. I try to stay in the now and live in the now. No, I think it keeps you young. So you're not a reminiscencer? No. <laughs> when did you... Is that, what? is that a word, Larry? No, I invented it. All right. Maybe it's my new symbol. Well, Reminis yeah. Inventing words. It's HIPAA, brother, so I know. <laughs> I, I like to learn, but... You know, uh, when... Good, good point. When did you decide music would be a career? Well, um, I, I, I learned early on this was what I wanted to do, maybe about 12 years old. I knew that this is what I'd want to do the rest of my life, yeah. You knew it then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, what burst you on the scene? Well, how did the world get to know Prince, the then Prince? Well, um, uh, by the way, I'm still Prince. I just, I use a different sound for my name, which is none. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard not to refer to you. It's hard to call you. Oh. It, it's cool. Okay. Yeah, it's cool. Your understanding of this plight we have faced with. Oh, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, what was the question? The question was, <laughs> no, I, good, you threw me. I forgot the question. Uh, the, the question, what was the question? I just asked the question, I forgot the question. You were saying how much you loved live television. Yes, that wasn't the question. <laughs> no, the question was, how did you get famous? How did you, how did the world get to know you? What happened? Was it a record? An appearance, something. Well, uh, it started with a lot of appearances I was doing uh, in and about Minneapolis, and uh, word just spread about. So you were a local was, name. Yeah, what I could do, and then uh, um, I was taken out to Los Angeles by uh, uh, my first manager, whose name escapes me, <laughs> and uh, uh, other people started getting to see what I could do. And then, did you have a hit record? Uh, no, we were just talking about making one right at that point. And what burst it for you? Hmm? What did it for you? The, the song? Yeah. Uh, the song was called Soft and Wet. And that, that the first, uh, immediately became a hit and you were known? Uh, uh, um, quietly. Uh, but a lot of people knew about me because um, I was, I used Stevie Wonder as an inspiration whom I look up to a great deal just um, for um, the way that he crafted music and his, his connection to the spirit. And uh, boy, uh, back then I, I used him as a role model in trying to play all the instruments and be very self-contained and keep my vision clear. So word spread very quickly about what I could do. A lot of people knew about it. Yeah. How would you describe your music? Mm, um, what idiom would you put it in? The only thing I could think of, because I really don't like categories, but the only thing I could think of is inspirational. And I think music that is from the heart falls right into that category. People who really feel uh, what it is that they're doing. And uh, uh, ultimately, all music is uh, or can be inspirational. And it's, that's why it's so important to let your gift be guided by something more clear. You know? The thing is, we don't know. You know, you think you know where that gift comes from. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We're going to see as we break. Here's a portion of a video from that brand new album, Rave Unto the Joy Fantastic. Our guest is the artist. Watch. By the way, all those, uh, those things that you just saw, the... Uh, the videos they do, you do in your own studio in Minneapolis, huh? A good portion of them. Yeah. So we, we don't think of L.A., Nashville, all these hot spot New York places. Minneapolis gets it done, too. Huh? Uh, Minneapolis has always been the bomb. You don't, you, yeah. you don't have to go outside of that. Now, where does your inspiration come from? I like to believe that my inspiration comes from God. And that Did you always believe that? Uh, no, as you as you grow older, you, you, um, you learn and you... Uh, you start to, um, you, you get smarter, yeah. Because and you were once kind of raucous, right? I mean, you're, mm -hmm. right? You would say you would, well, not anti-spiritual, you certainly would no, not no. think of you as a great believing soul. Well. <laughs> true or not? No, I, I don't believe that to be always true. Always were. Oh, I've always known 
that God was my creator and that uh, uh, without him uh, boy, nothing works uh, it, it works to a point and then it just kind of deteriorates entropy takes place when bad things have happened to you do you blame oh, him absolutely not no. how do you explain how do you resolve it in yourself I, I, I learn from it and I don't I don't wallow in it I don't spend time in a place I, I let myself move on you know R right today I could uh, sit and say uh, I have animosity towards uh, a comp record company yeah a company that owns the rights to my work you know they're they're businessmen they're doing what it is that makes their business successful and I'm also allowed to do things that make my business business successful and for me that would be to own my work so I just chose to step away from that and knowing that I sent a nice letter to the president then president because they changed a lot weekly during <laughs> that time and I told him that I loved him and that you know uh, I was glad that I had this experience you know so uh, you would say even though we don't like to look back that dispute turns out now to be an experience that worked for you well um, I think my understanding of it is what worked for me uh, I don't consider it proper that my creations belong to someone else. I, uh, I can go up to a little kid on the street and say, uh, do you know that I don't own Purple Rain? And they're appalled by that. So uh, my understanding of it is what pretty do much Do you is. still not own Purple Rain? No, I, I'll have to re-record it to own a new master copy of that. We've done that with the song 1999. There's a new master recording of it. I want to ask about that and that how you looked ahead. Uh, 1999 came out in the early 80s. We'll be right back with the artist uh, formerly known as Prince. We'll be including your phone calls at the bottom of the hour. Don't go away. I know you're going to do a pay-per-view special uh, the year 2000. It's going to air New Year's. And you say that's the last time you're ever going to play 1999, right? Yes, sir. Tell me the origin of that. How, what were you thinking in 1980? What was it, two? Uh, 1982 I wrote that um, um, we were sitting around watching a special about 1999 and a lot of people were talking about the year and uh, speculating on what was going to happen and I just found it real ironic how everyone that was around me whom I thought to be very uh, optimistic people were dreading those days and I uh, I always knew I'd be cool. I, I never felt like this was going to be a rough time for me. I knew that there were going to be rough times for the Earth uh, because this system is based in entropy and it's, it's pretty much headed in a certain direction. Uh, so I, I just wanted to write something that gave hope. And uh, what I find is people listen to it and no matter where we are in the world, I always get the same type of response from it. Dick Clark just rated it one of the ten great songs of the millennium. Oh. Great records of the millennium. Did you have any idea it would be as one prophetic as it was and as successful as it was? Uh, not to sound arrogant, but there, there was a point during rehearsal we were working on it and the, the song was going to be sung in a three-part harmony like uh, uh, Sly and the Family Stone song. And um, I, we all, we all got together and we started singing it and it wasn't really working. So what I did is I said, all right, you sing your harmony for the first part, then you sing your harmony for the second part, and I'll sing my harmony for the third. And it broke, when that breakup happened like that and everybody got their parts separated, then I knew we had something real special. Are you surprised at how long it has been around? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been around a while, <laughs> so... But I mean, now, now 1999 is here. Were you right? Well, when you listen to the music, there are a lot of people running around, kind of <laughs> Y2K in it, and we just kind of chilling and studying. Are you worried about Y2K? No, sir. <laughs> Not at all? No. Some computer's going to go wrong. You'll fly. I, yeah, I don't worry about too much anyway. You don't? No. no. Did you ever? When no. you had disputes, arguments with record companies, mm -hmm. taking a stand, were you a worrier? No, I think once I started writing Slave on my face, I pretty much knew the outcome. 
I mean, you, you have to understand that it, that word on one's face pretty much changes that, the dynamic of any meeting that you're in uh, when they see it. And how did people react to you when they did see it? Um, well, the record company didn't really <laughs> say too much. They just kind of... <laughs> All right, uh, what's the business at hand today? <laughs> you know, and that was it. <laughs> We'll take a break and we'll come back with the artist, uh, the artist formerly known as Prince. You got a concert coming up? Yes, sir. Where? Uh, it's going to be uh, from our sound stage at Paisley Park. Uh, you need to come. It's going to be is it? off the chart. Uh, well, uh, it's going to be on the 18th. Why do we have to, why? We can't announce when it is? No, because it's going to air on. The oh, it's going to air, I see. First secret of it. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing the old game show. <laughs> we'll be right back with the artist formerly known as Prince. Don't forget the concert. It's on. Don't go away. Yeah. This pay-per-view concert will air New Year's Eve for only $19.99. It's as low as you get in pay-per-view. And you can order it from In Demand. A lot of guest stars in this too. Oh yeah. I just spoke with Lenny Kravitz. He's gonna come jam with us. Uh, we got Maceo Parker, Larry Graham, the Family Stone. Uh, we're trying to get Sly out out of his crib, so he'll come <laughs> down. Um, uh, who else? Mavis Staples. Uh, she's going to do a couple numbers. The so great Larry sure. Graham's going to join us at the end of the show. He's maybe the great bass player in the world. Certainly uh, one of the best. Well, you, if you ask me, that's, <laughs> that's it. Well, legends live. Yeah. Uh, you are now, what, 42 years old? So they tell me. I do don't, you feel 42? No, no. I, I don't count birthdays. You don't celebrate them either? No. No happy birthday? No. Oh. Right, okay. <laughs> let's, let's take a call. St. Louis for the artist formerly known as Prince. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi. Good. Um, I've been a friend since 78. <laughs> uh, my favorite cut on the Rave album is So Far So Pleased. And I wanted to know what inspired you to add this to Rave because it seems like it's really different from the rest of the cuts. So I just want to know. Um, I think my, um, my love of rock music and living in Minneapolis, I'm always going to have my guitar in, in, in the mix somewhere. And uh, my, the chance that I got to uh, work with Gwen Stefani, I wanted something that she sounded really cool on, so uh, I put that on there. Has a lot of music affected you? Like, do you like jazz music? Oh, yes, sir. Miles Davis, I learned a lot from. I learned a lot about space from Miles. Space is a sound, too, and can be used uh, very inventively. If he was know. also technically a great player, was he not? Uh, yes, so they say, yeah. Uh, the Purple Rain concept, autobiographical? Uh, semi, yeah. Um, Albert Magnoli wrote that, uh, the script for that. Um, my whole thing was to, um, I really wanted to chronicle the life I was living at the time, which was uh, in an a area that had a lot of great talent and a lot of rival rivalries. Uh, the time and I, I, I forgot to mention, they will be on the pay-per-view special. You, you got to see them <laughs> now. They're crazy. <laughs> so um, I wanted to chronicle that uh, that vibe. Of Were my you life. surprised at its success? Um, <laughs> Just not pompous. Maybe yeah. you weren't. Maybe you knew you had something. Well, you know, you can kind of get a feel. There was no movie out like that at the time. That, that's what I tend to do in all the things that I do. Is uh, you know, the, the idea with art and ins inspiration is to try to let it grow and, and move forward. If there's stagnation, you can always come with something and cut through the maze. So do you sense that you're different uh, in that regard? You're certainly you're unique. Yeah, my music, I think, is different, yeah. Uh, Cambridge, hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, what a pleasure it is to see you in an interview situation. What um, a pleasure to be seen. <laughs> he doesn't do many. I know, I know. It's, it's great. I'm having a great time watching this. Um, I'm a huge fan, and I have been for a long time. Um, Thank you. Since you've been called Prince and the artist formerly known as and the artist and the symbol, and I can't help but wonder, what do your friends call you? What do your closest friends call you? Good question. Meet you on the street. Okay, what do they say? Um, let's see. Larry calls me baby brother. Maite calls me honey. Um, um, let's see, my enemies call me uh, squiggle and you know, all kinds of crazy. What do you call your, let's say you call me. 
Hello? What do you say? This is who? Uh, I, I don't say that too much. <laughs> well, what would you say? You must make some... Do you ever call anyone? Very seldom. I don't like telephone. You don't? No. So you, you, it's rare that you hit a button and dial a number? Uh, usually the people I call are people that, are, that I'm close to, and they know my voice. What does my Tay call you? Um, honey. She never really calls me Prince. She never, even when you were Prince? Yeah, she never. Yeah, that there thing. she is. How is she doing? Oh, perfect. She is in Spain? No, she's in Miami now. She's visiting her mother. So on the, the Purple Rain thing, you could say you expected it, not surprised that it went as well as it did. Uh, I expected it, I, I, I think, because there was, like I said, there was nothing out like it at the time. And if only for Morris Day's performance, I thought he was incredible in it. And uh, uh, the music, uh, we were at uh, a very good place musically. Um, right today, I, c I feel like I could uh, put together something equally as interesting, um, uh, and it would be as successful if the right people are getting paid. You know, that may sound strange, but th this is a business, and when people are involved in it, you have successes, you know, and I understand that, and um, I knew there would be times where records wouldn't sell as much when I got away from those particular people, but I was cool with that because success pretty much is what you make it to be. So you're saying then you do need the suits, so to speak? Um, it depends it, it, on what you gauge success to be. I what do you, is financial your gauge word? No, not so much, because once I do the music, it's a success there. I mean, that's it for me. Now, on the selling tip, uh, for example, if an album goes down the chart, that isn't something I can control. I just did the music, you know. Um, uh, what you want is you want people to tune in New Year's Eve. You'd like to have a lot of people call in demand in order to see you. You want you're an artist. You want to be seen. Yes, but if it's a if it's an auditing situation where I don't know how many people are actually tuning in, it's not something I can control. They can actually say anything to me, right? Correct. Yeah. So, and you go. You have to go trust. Oh, oh, that's why contracts don't work. They're not based in trust. Do you therefore, have you lost, even as a spiritual person, lost trust in people? Oh, no, no. I've lost trust in contracts. I don't, I don't believe in contracts. Do you have I, a contract for the pay-per-view night? Uh, or a shaking hand? Or I'm, I'm not certain. I can go check, but... Uh, but you're not into them? I, I'm not into them, really. Our guest is the artist. We'll be back with more phone calls at the end of the program. We're going to meet the great bassist, Larry Graham, as well. Hey, Sorry. The is applauding. <laughs> we <laughs> he never calls anybody. It would be weird. Hello? No one's there. <laughs> we'll be right back with more phone calls. If we take two or three more, we'll break a record here. Don't go away. people were telling me today, I was just telling the artist, that, boy, you're going to have the artist on for now, it's going to be very hard because it's, he's very hard to talk to. Now, you're not hard to talk to. Where did this reputation begin that you are difficult, do you think? And I'm you're not hearing it here for the first time. Yeah, probably where all reputations begin. Uh, I think uh, the media plays a big part in one's perception of me. Until one sits down and actually talks to me, they can't really know me. Well, should you have been more public? Should you have done more of things like this? Um, no, I kind of did what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted my music, as even now, to speak loudest for me. But you, you're not uncomfortable here, are you? No, no, no. But, but the reputation is that you would be. How do you fight that other than by counteracting it? Well, I, I'm not... I don't think in terms of fighting. I don't, I'm not, I don't think that you win anything by fighting. Uh, you know, I'm the type of person that likes to look at things from exactly the way they are. And, and uh, yeah, yes, you do. Um, You're a perfectionist musically, right? Yeah. So you must get angry. I, I use my anger uh, with humor. I, I have a way of being very stern, but I always find the irony in it, and I always make it funny. I make it funny for myself and the person that I'm... So the person who's working on is not humbled or made to feel 
less than human. How do you handle that aspect of the media, which has often given you trouble, the, the tabloids? I, I don't have trouble with anybody. Really. You don't? I'm what? Do you read them? No. Do you hear about them? Uh, very seldom. Do you think any part of a personality's private life is our business? Do you think your marriage is our business? Well, you know, I, I'm like this. Um, uh, my music is my music. That's pretty much what you come to the party for. Naturally. Uh, um, if I give you something else, that's me giving you something else. If you seek something else, then there's something inside of you that's lacking, I would think. You know? So I think that personal actually means personal. And, and but do you, do, you, do you wonder why the public wants to know? Don't mm -hmm. wonder. No. <laughs> Are you interested in the personal lives of other people? See, Michael Jordan? Uh, let's see, who... Uh, yeah, are you interested in... All right, Michael Jordan. You're a big fan of Michael Jordan. Big fan of Michael Jordan. Are you interested in how his marriage goes? No. No. Interested in how he gets along with his children? Nope. No. Care I'm interested in how he gets along with that rim. <laughs> <laughs> well said. We'll be back with more of the artists formerly known as Prince. This is Larry King Live, Ted Turner Monday. Don't go away. We get New Year's Eve special with the artist on pay per view. Uh, before we take a break and meet Larry Graham, let's take another call. Houston, hello. Hi, uh, pleasure to talk to you, sir. Um, I've always known you to be. I've always known you to be a spiritual and God loving person, and uh, I've always respected that in your music. And I've known that you've always thanked God on every one of your CDs, and that has inspired me all my life. I love God myself. Well, that part of your inspiration is becoming a big. I can't. We lost that what? Oh, I'm sorry. We lost the call. I can finish it for her. Oh, what was your earliest inspiration, she's asked. That was it. Um, I was discussing this uh, with Larry today. We were just discussing the word inspiration and where we think it originated from. And? and um, ultimately, you, you know, you, if you go back, your father may inspire you. And then that your father, his father inspired him, and his father may have inspired well, him. Eventually, we get to Adam. Yeah, and eventually Adam had a father. You know. Ah. Oh. So, yeah, inspiration comes from God. That's the original source. And so to d to use your gift in a creative fashion, that's the best thing you can do. We're going to take a break and come back, and we'll be joined to finish the program by one of the great bassists of all time. He now is the bassist with uh, the artist. The great Larry Graham will join us right after this. You'll see the artist in a great uh, concert, an all-star concert on New Year's Eve, and in that concert will be his bassist, the great Larry Graham. How did you hook up with this? Why are you part of the concert? <laughs> <laughs> We got a new name. Wait a minute now. Come on. <laughs> what else? What, what, what are we going to call it? Uh, go to media again. Man. I don't <laughs> okay. What? You name it. Tune in for what? How did you hook up? Raven to the Joy 2000. How did you hook up with him? Well, um, <laughs> actually, just let me say something right quick before we get into that. Um, thank you for having me on the show. And uh, I've watched many of your shows, and I think you're a great person. And the picture you just showed me, your little baby, was just blew me away. Congratulations on that. Little chance. Uh, oh, you like yeah. them too. Yeah. But thanks for having me here. I've watched many of your shows and I think you're wonderful. And um, How did you I, I thought about what am I going to wear? So I think I'll let Larry King inspire my attire. So I'll this is my Larry King look. The King look. <laughs> well, we're close on time, so tell me how you uh, got together with We were in Nashville and I was playing a concert at the small venue. And uh, Baby Brother was playing the concert at the larger venue. And uh, he found out I was there, called me, and said, Hey, we're going to have a jam session. Uh, tonight after the show, would you like to come? And so I went, and uh, we walked into the, the club. Uh, my wife reached in her purse and pulled out my fuzz pedal in my cords, <laughs> and, <laughs> and hooked me up. And that was the first time we got a chance to play together. And that night, um, we said everything that we never got a chance to say to each other over the years. We talked through our music. And when that night was finished, I knew so much more about him and he knew so much more about me and we connected from then on and after that you know he said well I'm gonna be going on tour would you join me and we did one show then another show then another show and how important <laughs> is the bass? 
Oh man, the bass is, that's it. It's B-A-S-E, not B-A-S-S. That's a fish. B-A-S-E. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. How good is he? No, it's, man, he, he's, he taught me so much about respecting one another, uh, musicians listening to one another, and uh, uh, just the sound of his bass is it's undeniable. How good? What do you put in the jacket? You're cold, huh? Yeah, it's cold. Yeah, we man. might tell the audience. Yeah, it's freezing. Yeah, this is above and beyond. It's purple hot night. I don't want my voice to start shaking. We get purple. I'm nervous. We get purple. <laughs> We're almost out of time. How great is he? Uh, well, I tell you this: uh, the greatest musician that I've worked with, um, because I've worked with other musicians that were great, but they didn't allow me to really have the the freedom that I needed to be able to give them all that I could give them. Uh, with Baby Brother, he allows me the freedom to give all that I can give, and as a result, what we're doing now, when you hear it, you can see that it's coming from the heart, which is why we're touching unselfish. hearts. Totally unselfish. Great pleasure meeting you. Thank I'm you. I'm honored. And wait a minute, let me show you this ring, folks. Put the ring up there. Look at that ring. It says Graham, that's in case I forget my name. And those are diamonds, <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> And thank you, little brother. <laughs> All right. Baby brother. <laughs> Baby brother. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed tonight's edition of Larry King Live. We certainly did. Thanks for joining us. We're going to leave you with a nice shot here. Watch. You're about to see Prince in his first interview for television. Now, he took a stab at, uh, at being interviewed in print a few months ago, but this is the first time Prince has ever agreed to talk in front of cameras. The questions were provided by MTV's news department, and the person you'll hear asking them at Prince's request is his manager, Steve Farnioli. Now, Prince is not alone here. The interview was shot at the filming of his new video, America, and the people that you're going to see with him are extras from the video. For the first time on television, this is Prince. One thing I'd like to say is that I don't live in a prison, and I'm not afraid of anything. I haven't built any walls around myself. I am just like anyone else. I need love and water, and I don't really consider myself a superstar. I live in a small town and I always will because I can walk around and be me. And That's all I want to be, that's all I ever tried to be. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just tried to do my best. You know, somebody dug it and... James Brown played a big influence on my style. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, my stepdad put me on the stage with him, and I danced a little bit until the bodyguard took me off. The reason why I like James Brown so much is on my way backstage, on my way out, I saw some of the finest dancing girls I've ever seen in my life. And I think, in that respect, uh, he influenced me by his control over his group, his dancing girls, his apples, and his oranges. In the Rolling Stone interview, you said you were surprised by so many people. 
comparing you to Hendrix when you play guitar? <clears throat> um, a lot had to do with uh, I could say the color of my skin. And that's not where it's at at all. It really isn't. Um, Hendrix was very good, but there'll never be another one like him. And it would be a pity to try. I strive for originality in my work. And hopefully it'll be perceived that way. Some people have criticized you for selling out to the white rock audience with Purple Rain and leaving your black listeners behind. How do you respond to that? Oh, come on. Come on. <clears throat> Cufflinks like this cost money, okay? Let's be frank. Can we be frank? If we can't be nothing else, we might as well be frank, okay? Seriously. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that will continue. I, uh, I, I think there are a lot of people out there that um, understand this because they support me and my habits, and I support them and theirs. Someone in Minneapolis recently told us that several months ago, they were in a studio there when David Rifkin, your sound engineer, walked in. They asked him what he thought of the new Prince album, Around the World in a Day. He said, it's great, but wait till you hear the new album. Apparently, he meant that you're already working on a new LP, ready to go. And that this one was a strong return to your funk roots. Is this true? Can you elaborate? What will it be called? When is it due out? And what's the music like? Don't you like surprises? not uh, it is true I record very fast uh, it goes even quicker now that the girls help me the girls meaning Wendy and Lisa not these girls um, I don't really think uh, I left my funk roots to begin with anywhere along the line. Um, around the world in the day is a funky album. Live, it's even funkier. I wanted this album to be listened to and judged, critiqued, critiqued, uh, listened to as a whole. Um, it's hard to take trip and go around the block and stop when the trip is 400 miles. Dig? Wait. <clears throat> I didn't write Purple Rain. Someone else did. And it was a story, a fictional story, and it should be perceived that way and nothing else. Um, Violence is something that happens in everyday life, and we were only telling a story. I wish it was looked at that way, but uh, I don't think anything we did was unnecessary. Sometimes for the sake of humor, we may have went overboard, and if that was the case, then I'm sorry, but it was not the intention. There's no one that could uh, wreck a house like they could. And I was a bit troubled by their demise, but like I said before, it's important that one's happy first and foremost. We know you gave Andre Simone the song Dance Electric for his new album. And we know that you two had some kind of falling out a few years back. When and how did you patch things up? Um, I saw him in the discotheque one night, and I uh, grabbed him by his shirt, and I said, 
come on, get this hit. You know I got this hit, don't you? Dance electric. Give me a big spunky. You, you need it. You need that. Don't, hey, come here. Don't you play. Don't, hey. No, 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 you're not crazy. I'm crazy. I'm the one that's crazy. Okay? What you gonna do? You gonna come by? For real? You mean you ain't mad or nothing? So what? Yeah, tomorrow. No? Cool. If I'm directing myself, I consult Stephen, my manager. On directing other Paisley Park artists, I consult the artists first and foremost. All I hear in my head going like a volcano, baby. Screams of passion. One thing I try to do with the things that I direct, mainly for our acts, is go for the different, the out of the norm, the uh, avant purple, so to speak. And the thing that's, that's unique about the situation that I'm in now with these people is that they all know who they are and they agree with me when we say one thing that uh, our record label man all our acts and the music that we produce is an alternative and if someone wants to go along for that ride then cool when the time does come where you have to turn around and use your influence um, a lot of people have already willingly done that and that upset me that he didn't. It's just disappointment, you know, from one person to another that he wasn't there when he was asked to be, you know, sort of why, you know, you feel what a jerk. But, uh, I mean, I would like to ask that same jerk to please maybe get in contact with Ken Cragen and donate one of his tracks for this album because millions of people love him and millions of people would like to hear him and he doesn't owe a responsibility to anybody, but he does owe it to everybody. We had talked to the people that were doing the um, USA for Africa. And they said it was cool that I gave up a song for the album. Which was the best thing for both of us, I think. I'm strongest in a situation where I'm surrounded by people I know. Uh, I met all these folks today. Ain't that right? right. See, right. see, <laughs> you know, it, you know. So uh, it's better that I did it that way. The music than going down and participating there, I probably would have just clammed up with so many great people in the room. I'm an admirer of all the people who participated in that particular outing, and I don't want there to be any hard fit. Gotta get back in the studio. Uh, um, did you hear so-and-so? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get in the studio right now. Who, was, who did that for you? Everybody's got somebody. Yeah, oh, well, um, contrary to what a lot of people might believe, it was never somebody who was my contemporary. There was never, like, any rivalry between you and Mr. Jackson? Oh, not to me, no. That's, okay. Yeah. So I love the story of you, you know, there's all these prints, I'm sorry. That, well, that's the guy you used to be. Mm -hmm. There's the story of you turning down bad. Well, <laughs> you know, that Wesley Snipes character, right. that, that would have been me. <laughs> All right, now you, <laughs> now you run that video in your mind.
the first line of that song is your butt is mine. Your butt is mine. Now I said, who's going to sing that to whom? Because you sure ain't singing it to me. And I sure ain't singing it to you. So <laughs> right there we got, you know, right there we got a problem. It's so weird now. You were made out to be this weird cat. And he was like Mr. Disney and <laughs> you're married. Oh, <laughs> Chillin'. <laughs> like a married man well you know play it you know there again you know hopefully the press will get to the point where we'll just all just it'll be a law where you have to tell the truth <laughs> it won't be about speculation um, um, I, you know I'm a musician I I live for that I live for playing and, and, and creating songs we get wrapped up in a lot of things that's what writing slave on your face is about you know I got wrapped up in the ego of the whole thing. Anybody who has followed Prince through the years knows that he was a very private person. Yeah, he did not do many television interviews, but he did one with Fox 9 back in the early 2000s. Robin Robinson sat down with Prince, and we didn't realize at the time just how rare an opportunity it was. Well, Paisley Park is pretty much representative of uh, everything I am musically. I love Minnesota. I've lived here all my life and plan to stay, so uh, I wanted to have all this at my fingertips so that I didn't have to run out to L.A., back and forth in New York. Because that's a different atmosphere, and uh, I found that you tend to reflect whatever it is that's around you. And so I wanted peace around me, so I stayed here so that I could reflect peace. I needed a place like this to um, uh, uh, create from. I don't mind letting the kids into something that they actually help preserve. Uh, it's their continued support of my music that uh, allows uh, these doors to stay open. For the seven nights, there's going to be uh, this kind of a look back and a celebration of uh, the musicians and the songs and the spirit of spirit of which we made this music. Uh, there'll be a Love Sexy night, a Graffiti Bridge night, a Parade night, a Diamonds and Pearls night. Uh, it's going to be real fun. We're culminating the whole thing with a concert on uh, the 13th at Northrop with a lot of new friends I've met, like uh, Angie Stone and Najee. Last night, uh, I'm gonna just jam. It's not gonna be real set. I'm not gonna know what I'm gonna play ahead of time.
Girl, I'm so cool. <laughs> Y'all two fools got fired. <laughs> How do you get fired? What did you do? It was fate, man. Yeah, it was fate. It was. Ain't nobody bad like me. We had ambition and, um, you know, a little talent. Hey. How do you get fired from <laughs> <laughs> The time was right. The time was right. We it got fired. We it got fired. It was fate, man. It was just the, t the time was right. Just talk about spirituality and God and just being happy. I, I feel something when I see the video. I, I get, not just because I directed it and because I'm in it, but even people that tell me when they see it, they get, they get teary-eyed or they, they get goosebumps or something. You're looking for a man that'll make you feel like time is just a figure. Good evening and welcome to a special 90-minute edition of BET Tonight. I'm Tavis Smiley and as always, glad that you are with us and we are pleased tonight to be joined by the artist formerly known as Prince for whom we'll take your phone calls for the entire 90 minutes tonight. Glad he's with us here in Washington. Artist, how are you? Perfect. It is nice to see you. Nice to be seen. Thanks for coming on, man. <laughs> Let me start by asking you, how's the foot? I know that you just wrapped this, we all know you just wrapped the tour with Shock and Larry, who we're going to be joined by, of course, later in the program tonight. Uh, but you had to reschedule some dates because of the foot. Tell me how, and the important things first, how's the foot doing? Well, uh, everything's fine now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I uh, heard it in a strange freak accident. I step, misstepped on a ramp, and my toe went underneath my foot. And when that happens, when your big toe gets underneath your foot, all trouble breaks loose. But um, everything's cool now. Uh, I, I, from the bottom of my heart, I'm, I'm so disappointed that I wasn't able to play L.A. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so were we, those of us who live in L.A. who were waiting for you. Yeah, and, hopefully uh, I'll understand. be able to reschedule and yeah. get that one down. But if not, you know, these are the things of life. Yeah, they are. Um, let me ask you about the tour. Did you enjoy it? Um, I know you, you just finished, I'm sure you're, you're a little bit tired now, but what did you, what'd you think of the tour? You, you, you still like going out doing dates? Oh man, that's, that's my life. Uh, I got in the, the music business because I loved playing so much. Uh -huh. um, you don't really get into the business to be a star, at least I didn't. I didn't get in to make a whole bunch of money or anything like that and meet a whole bunch of women. Uh -huh. Just so happens those are the things that came along with it. But uh, uh, I was always uh, playing a lot and uh, It, it's what it's all about, jumping off pianos. That's what it's, it's all about, about jumping yeah. off pianos yeah, that's and hurting your foot when you jump. No, well, yeah. the jumping off the pianos is the easy part. If somebody right. puts a monitor <laughs> someplace <laughs> they're supposed to be, then... That's the bad part. Then we're in trouble, yeah. I'm wondering when you're on tour whether or not you still enjoy, enjoy playing your old stuff. I've heard all kinds of rumors, and we are going to spend some time tonight, as you and I have already discussed, talking about all kinds of rumors that are out there about you. I want to give you a chance in person, live on BET, to respond to a lot of the mess and things that your critics have been saying about you. I want to hear it straight from you. Uh, but I'm wondering, for starters, whether or not you still, when you're out on the tour, enjoy playing your old stuff. I've read stuff that said you like your old stuff and you enjoyed other stuff that says you're burnt out on playing that, you're tired of playing certain songs. What's the story on what you like to play in concert? Um, if there were any statements made by me about not enjoying playing old music, it was probably when I was still tied to the contract with Time Warner. Mm -hmm. uh, once I got out of the contract, I started to uh, 
reevaluate my trip, and um, uh, I realized that you know these are like my children, and uh, um, in this uh, upcoming year, 1999, we're going to make a valiant effort to regain uh, ownership of the master recordings. Mm -hmm. They are they are a representation of me, and they uh, uh, will be all that will be left uh, upon my departing of this uh, experience. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go there in the conversation. You know I want to go there. We've already discussed we're going to go there. Since you mentioned Warner, let me pick up on that segue and run with it. Uh, it is not lost on any of us that you had, for lack of a better word, a pretty bizarre, if not nasty, egregious split with Warner when you left. Back up if you can for a little bit and tell me about what happened, why you left Warner, why you felt so visceral about that split when you left. Well, um, it, it, it's, it was a long brewing thing. Um, to put it in a quick capsule, uh, once I really realized I wanted to be out of the contract is uh, during the time that we released Most Beautiful Girl in the World. Now that master recording I owned and I was allowed to step outside of the Time Warner family to uh, promote and distribute the record. And I had a worldwide hit. Mm -hmm. uh, now that was during a time when, you know, you uh, are quote unquote not happening anymore and you're not cutting edge anymore and, and these particular types of um, descriptions. So. Uh, uh, that just sort of wet my taste buds as to uh, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Uh, I think I'm better suited to market my own music. I uh, am in a situation now with New Power Generation Records that I can um, uh, take the music and repackage it and sell it in various arenas, uh, the internet, uh, direct to consumer, all kinds of things at concerts. You know, I was never allowed to do this before. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a lucrative sum of money, and I've made a lot of money since I've left Time Warner. A lot more than I made when I was with them. All right, and this is um, uh, a, a little-known fact, I think, and that's why some of the uh, you hear some of the rumors about me being on financial difficulty and things like that. Like, uh, uh, hopefully tonight we'll get to talk about media manipulation. Oh, we of, will. We will of, indeed. Um, our people. <clears throat> let, let me let me ask you um, to respond to something that one of your critics, a number of your critics, have said. Um, it's been said repeatedly that you, comparatively speaking, compared to other artists on Time Warner, at Warner Brothers, were treated quite wonderfully. Uh, mm -hmm. That you didn't have everything you wanted, but that you, in fact, were given carte blanche at that company. And that part of what really happened was that you got spoiled by the people at Warner Brothers. And when you asked for more and more and more, they had a difficult time trying to reel the artist Prince at the time, trying to reel you in because they'd given you so much leeway, so much flexibility, and you just started to act like a little kid, started ranting and raving uh, and throwing a tantrum. And the real, the real problem was uh, that they just could not reel you in because they'd been so flexible with you all along. Well, listen, um I'm not one to look at myself through other people's eyes. That's their perception of me. Mm -hmm. um, but do you buy that perception? Absolutely not. Um, what had happened really was that uh, the music business runs like this. You'll have a manager, you'll have a, an attorney, you'll have uh, um, various record company people. Everybody's taking a cut of everything that you do. Um, it got down to the wire there and uh, some people who were not in the studio at the time wanted a cut of When Doves Cry because, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they wanted a cut of the song Pray by Hammer uh, because it contained a sample, When Doves Cry, mm -hmm. all right? So when you're in the fold, when you're in the club and everybody's getting a piece of everything, your tour, your publishing, um, any endorsements, when they're getting a piece of all of that, you will have hit records. The moment you step away from that and you want to, uh, in fact, uh, take control of your own life, <laughs> um, your own experience, uh, then uh, you'll find um, you're not hot anymore. You know, now my music really hasn't changed. I mean, you can listen to a song like The One and for, um, uh, through my eyes, not other people's eyes, through my eyes, that's some of the best work I've ever done. You know, I, I rank it right up there with anything that I've ever produced. But, uh, uh, 
looking at my experience through someone else's eyes, you're going to hear these things like spoiled child and what have you. Warner's was very good to me. Don't don't get me wrong, and I and I learned from the experience. In fact, it when I like I said when I reevaluated the trip, I found that um, uh, uh, I had to challenge them with love. And in fact, I wrote a letter to. Uh, one of the presidents there, that I in fact loved him and I, I uh, thanked him for signing me in the first place, and that we had, had in fact uh, each chosen to be in the position that we were in. Hold that thought one second. We are just getting started, as you can tell, with our conversation tonight with the artist, formerly known as Prince. There is much more to come on BET tonight. Don't go away. Later in this program tonight, BET's world premiere of the artist's latest video, Come On. That's coming up later in the show. Plus, joined by his friends and tour mates, Shaka Khan and Larry Graham, also with us tonight. We're just getting started. The artist is happy, I'm happy. Stay with us, we're back in just a moment. Our friend, our new friend, the artist, formerly known as Prince. Does anybody get away with calling you Prince these days, or do you, like do they get slapped if they call you Prince or something? No, no, no. I, um, you know what I find in in airports and um, outside of the venues and things like that. Uh, people of color will always call me Prince, mm -hmm. and what I also find is people of color always smile and they always say they love me you know uh, uh, on the other side the lighter persuasion we have uh, people just kind of stare and mm -hmm. they'll say Prince and then they'll correct themselves no the artist or the you know and they'll get confused right. and it, it, it's interesting looking through my eyes at this particular phenomenon <laughs> right. you know why, why do you think that is <clears throat> The, the, the people of color treat you one way and that lighter persuasion to use your phrase treat you another way with regard to what to call you when they see you. I, I think we tend to um, live through our own more so and uh, we champion when one of us makes good mm -hmm. and um, uh, we never forget. Like I'm, I, I'm so thankful I always have my people at my shows mm -hmm. and they remember all the way back. Oh, do uh, they? Absolutely. When I was doing the Purple Rain tour, I had a lot of people who I knew I'd never see again at the concerts, just screaming in uh, places they thought they were supposed to scream. You know, so that mountain type, a uh, mountain top type uh, situation is not really all it's cracked up to be. Let me let me let me back up. Let me digress if I can, and talk more specifically about the name change. There are a lot of folk who are still in fact confused and don't know exactly what precipitated the name change. It is my understanding that the name change uh, was inextricably tied to what happened with the Warner Brothers situation when you left. Ex and if I'm wrong, disabuse me of that notion, but explain to me and to those who are watching why the name change happened. What, what was that all about? Well, I'm finding uh, after studying my music now uh, for the past three or four years that uh, when one completely listens to one's inspiration and inner voice, you will create things out of it that will lead you towards enlightenment. And one of the things that I was asked to do by my inner voice, which I believe to be uh, my higher power, mm -hmm. uh, I was asked to change my name. Now, uh, it seemed pretty absurd at the time, but what I found out is when I got into a situation with Warner's, uh, where I wanted to leave, they said, you can't leave, we have you under contract. So you, you as in Prince. That's right. Was under contract. Right. Okay. So then I changed my name and uh, uh, found that I could record with this name outside of that contract. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, um, as you can see, Most Beautiful Girl in the World was not by Prince. It was by me. Right. All right. And... Um, the other thing I found is that it freed me from being Prince. It freed me from thinking like Prince, and um, uh, uh, it freed me from my ego. 
What's, what's wrong with thinking like Prince? Prince had some major, major, major hits. It's what made you who you are today in terms of, I mean, it started you down this path. I'm just curious as to what you mean when you say it caused you to stop thinking like Prince as if that was some, something bad or something negative. No, it, but Prince was in a trap. Prince was in, under contract to, Prince was owned, mm -hmm. you know. Um, now, I can't use Purple Rain. I can't use this song. I can't sell the song Purple Rain now unless I record it again, mm -hmm. which I have plans to do if I can't, in fact, get the master recording that I believe is uh, one of my children, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So um, uh, I, did, I, I had to get freed from the, uh, the mentality of being a slave. You understand? Right. Okay, and that's not to equate myself with the same uh, situations that we suffered coming to this country. But, you know, everything is relative. If you are owned, you are owned. If you can't do everything that you want to do, if there's a ceiling and you're not allowed to go as high as you can go, you are in fact a slave. <clears throat> Let me squeeze in some phone calls, and I know there are many people standing by tonight. Um, I read somewhere that you don't like the word fan. I don't want to say we're going to go to the phone calls and get calls from your fans. And I want y'all to play yourself when you call and say, I'm your biggest fan, Prince, or the artist. What do you, what do you have against the word fan? Are we supposed to change our names, too? No, no, no. <laughs> well, it, it's short for fanatic. Right. And um, uh, if you look that word up, it's not very pretty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gloria in Florida, you're on the air, and I'm glad you called. Hello, how you doing? I'm well, how are you? Good, good. Well, um, the artist, I just wanted to say that I truly admire you, and I really am, was so proud of you when you took that move uh, from Warner Brothers to doing your own thing. Uh, I used to work in a record store, so many of your records, and today you look so happy being mm -hmm. in charge of who you are. Yes, And it's kind of like to thine own self be true. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I truly admire you, and I appreciate your music so much. I'm sitting here with my... My 21-year-old, who still, uh, he thinks you're the best thing since Bag Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Gloria, I thank you for your phone call. You, you, is, is Gloria right on point when she suggests that you are happier now than you've ever been? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I thank God every day. We as people, because we have to answer to a 9-to-5 or answer to a boss or whatever, you know, Man didn't come to earth like that. Man came to earth for recreation, which means recreation, and to recreate um, uh, love, you know? And you can't do that when you're constantly angry and you're constantly being held back. Um, I, I had good, wonderful years at Warner Brothers. It just came to be a point where I wanted to go farther, you know? I was being accused of being a bad businessman and things like that with my record label over there. <clears throat> Excuse me. When in fact, I wasn't allowed the same leeway as, say, some of the other um, so-called icons that are still over there doing business with them today. So um, if, if the playing field's not equal, and it really wasn't, and they know it wasn't, then you got to step away. So I am, in fact, happier, yes. You used the phrase that you were accused of many things, and you have, in fact, of late been accused of many things. Uh, you have a lot of, can't use the word fans, you have a lot of supporters and a lot of folk who love you, mm -hmm. with a lot of folk who've had a lot of things not so nice to say about you of late. When we come back, I want to, with your permission, walk down a list of things that have been said, written about you of late, and give you a chance to respond. Is that all right with you? Love that. Let's do this. Let's do it. We're joined by the artist. Your phone calls for him. We will premiere it a little bit later in the show. That new video, Come On, also joined tonight later by Shaka Khan and Larry Graham. We're back after these messages. Stay with us. Strangely beautiful, beautiful strange. That's what we say instead of the name. Soul music, real soul music, was about freedom. Freedom to love, to stand up, and to be free. We are the new power generation, and this is what freedom sounds like. You are just like my favorite song. Come on, baby. Come on, Larry Graham, Shaka Khan, and the new power generation featuring the artist, available on MPG. Mm. Welcome back. I'm Tavis Smiley. This is BET Tonight, mm. Like a Phoenix. 
NPG Records is the artist's new company that rolls out of the ashes, if I can paraphrase that way, out of the ashes of his contract with Warner Brothers. I am wondering, artist, since you were, for a variety of reasons, unhappy at Warner, you left, you started NPG, how have you structured your company differently than the experience you had at Warner Brothers so that when people sign, when other artists sign with you, the artist, that they don't end up as unhappy with you as you were with Warner? Does that not make any sense? Oh, well, it makes uh, sense. Okay. The, <clears throat> first of all, once again, I just want to say, you know, the um, industry way of doing business is, is cool for them. We're just an alternative. And the first rule with us is that there are no rules. Um, um, and the main thing that I want to stress is there are no contracts. All right, now that's very important for several reasons. Um, we don't plan to go into litigation and fight one another. We don't go into the agreement uh, thinking we're gonna end up in court. You know, we go into this to make music. Larry and I have no contract, and he always um, makes a joke that, you know, if we did, what would we put on it? You know, the studio time is free. All we have to do is keep the electricity on, you know. Um, the other thing that's, uh, real important to us is we, we all together have started to study words like con, tract, and the fact that con being the prefix means something negative. It's the opposite of pro, all right? You have words like consequence, you know, we're the gen genesis. We don't want to be the, the end, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, contradiction, convince, trying to convince something of, somebody of something that they should already know. Um, uh, we don't want to adopt somebody else's way of doing business. You know? But, but aren't, aren't artists, with all due respect, contracts protective measures? I mean, you, don't, you may not mm -hmm. go into a situation expecting someone to play you or to diss you or to act a fool in the process, but if in fact that does happen, how then does the artist, for example, protect <clears throat> himself even? Well, I can't be played. Uh, a person trying to play me plays themselves. Um, it's happened many times in the past. Uh, one day, maybe I'll bring that out, but uh, Larry Graham's not gonna play me. I'm not gonna play Larry Graham. Shaka Khan's not gonna play but did, but did, wasn't you. But wasn't it your thought when you first signed with Warner Brothers that they would never try to play you, and yet you ended up having to change your name and leave because they, at some point in your mind, started trying to play you? Well, they initiated the contract. I could have gotten into uh, the music business without a contract if that's the way the system was set up. That's my point, is that that's the way they do business. Mm -hmm. We do business differently. We do business in a, uh, in a way that there is no business. <laughs> it's about the art. You know, it's about the relationship and the love of one another. Before I get to some of these remarks that some of your critics have made about you of late, since we're talking about contracts, you saw earlier at the, uh, at the outset of the show, as a matter of fact, you were watching that show that night, I understand, when Jimmy and Terry were on, mm -hmm. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and they made some comments about contracts. Uh, one call came through from a young person and asked them their advice on what to do. The caller said, what should I do if I want to get started in the music business? And I, 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 you and I talked about this a few days ago, and I got the sense in our private conversation that you were a bit unhappy with the advice that Jimmy and Terry offered this particular caller. Was I, am I totally off base here? Well, yeah, Jimmy and Terry, they, they're my brothers. You know, they know yeah. I got much love for them, but um, their advice to uh, the caller was ill-advised because it's most important that you keep ownership of your master recordings. That's what, that's your social, uh, social security. If you don't have that, you out to poop. <laughs> You're straight off the meter. And um, if we don't st start stating that first off, if we don't start getting that right first off, you know, all, all else will uh, fall afterwards. Let me walk down a list. Uh, I've got a couple minutes here before I have to take our, another break here. I, want, I can get a couple things out, I think. Um, I want to throw this at you, and I want you to respond. Mm -hmm. I'm reading from a national magazine. Had this to say about you. Where was Rolling Stone? Where was Vibe? Talking about when your last CD Mm -hmm. set came out. Where was Rolling Stone? Where was Vibe? Prince demanded that they give him the cover for an interview. And so far, both Vibe and Rolling Stone have said no. I'm quoting from an executive at Rolling Stone, and I quote, before I quote, he's talking about the fact that there are a number of reasons you put somebody on the cover. Mm -hmm. The quote begins here. One reason is the impact they are having artistically. Another is the impact they are having culturally. 
A third is the impact they are having commercially. Right now, those factors are not conjoining to make it a given that we would put the artist on the cover. They're telling me I got a break. But this, what this guy is saying is that you're not having an impact artistically, culturally, or commercially enough to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. We got a break. We got a break. We got a break. Sit tight. Gonna... One second. Oh, He's man. ready to go. He's chomping at the bit. He is the artist formerly known as Prince. I know you want to hear his response to what Rolling Stone had to say about why they won't put him on the cover. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't Vibe put him on the cover? We'll get his response in just a second. You're watching BET Tonight, a special 90-minute show with the artist. We're back in just a moment. Welcome back. I'm Tavis Smiley. Glad that you are with us. Uh, I know the artist is glad that we are back. He was itching to jump, and I'm going to get to him in two seconds. He's scratching the table here. i got to get to him. For those who may have just turned in, what I said before the break, in case you didn't hear it, an executive at Rolling Stone, one of their editors, their music editor, in fact, says that, and I'm paraphrasing, the artist is not having the kind of impact artistically, culturally, and commercially to deserve being on the cover of Rolling Stone. Uh, an editor at Vibe magazine suggests artists that it's not to say that you don't still have a certain amount of greatness, but like Michael Jordan, he can still sink the last basket, but he's not the player he was at 25. They say that you seem to be heading further away from the cutting edge you once had and closer to some sort of R&B legends tour. And so far, you may not deserve to be on the cover of Vibe. Mm. Well, well, there's a lot in that one. I mean, <laughs> where should I begin? Wherever you want to begin. Uh, it's your show. All right, we'll, I'm just here moderating. Uh, we'll start with the, the cutting edge okay. part. Um, when a man is free, and uh, it, it puts him closer to God, first of all. The, the path is open to get to God. Um, it's probably in both of those magazines to keep me off the cover and out of their magazine because what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach freedom, all right? And I'm going to preach um, uh, the annihilation of contracts. All right, and see, without contracts, you ain't gonna need lawyers because nobody's gonna be in court arguing about money, which has no power, ultimately. All right, so it's in their best interest to keep me out of those magazines. I completely understand. I only ask them to put me in there, and I will ask for what I believe I deserve because I think I'm great. Mm -hmm. Just think I'm great. <laughs> You know, and we, you know we're still selling out arenas, mm -hmm. and so somebody else thinks I'm pretty great too. Uh, and I, I don't say that to be arrogant. I say that to show that um, I love myself. And uh, if more people did love themselves, they'd stop worrying about uh, whether someone was cutting edge or not. I want to get to this premiere video in a second, but let me just piggyback one quick question. Then we'll go and stand by. We're about to premiere the new video, the latest video from the artist, in about two seconds here. Uh, Part of what your critics also say with regard to what we're discussing now is that while you may be making money because you control your whole environment now, um, you're, keeping, you're keeping more of what you make. But that does not necessarily mean that you're selling more records than you used to sell. Isn't it not true, artists, that you're not selling the records at the level you used to sell them? Absolutely true. Okay. But then again, we're not in as many stores. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some stores are player hating. And and people play right. hate. That's right, yeah. rightfully so. It, you know, I expected this. Uh, but then again, I don't gauge success based upon the way other people gauge success. This isn't about sound scan and C-SPAN and all that. You know, this is about uh, um, our plan. You know, this is about what we believe now. And the, the, if you ask any artist, the music is a success upon creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you give it to somebody like a Rolling Stone or a Vibe and they start um, critiquing it, then y your perception changes. But that's looking through somebody else's eyes. So again, we, um, we gauge success based upon what we feel in our hearts. You know? uh, we've shut our minds off now. Minds should be used for what they were made for, filing cabinets. Okay. We think with our hearts. Okay. I am mad at you. We've been promising it to you for weeks, and now the time is finally here. It is the BET world premiere of the newest video from the artist entitled, Come On. Come on. Hit it, Lamar.
you got a young thing You don't care about me He's darker than quicksand He's taller than a tree But what you need is some real loving Instead of your ass fools I got the butter for your muffin Just need the keys to the room Come on, baby Come on, shake it now Come on, baby. Come on, shake it now. Come on, baby. Come on, shake it now. Come on, baby. Come on, shake it now. We could freeze in London. You could hear me say. And if you wanna make love, then you got to wear my ring. Cause I don't want no mystery. Much rather be found. Let's find a preacher so we can get it down, down, down. Come on, baby. Come on, shake it out. 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 You and your girlfriend, y'all two of a kind Just running these knuckleheads, three and four at a time For the youth won't be raised, but you're still acting wild The first rule and make it one, you can't be no child Instead of hitting that remake, why don't y'all hit the door? I'll book us on the red eye, we'll be good to go And if every life has got a reason, you can be mine Perfume in the bath, darling, champagne, while we die Come on, baby, come on, shake it out 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 come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, shake it out. 20 days in London, you ain't giving no love. Could it be another brother, man, that you're thinking of? Or could it be your girlfriend, who never ever been straight? When I ask you why you're hungry, you say you're already ate. You can play me if you wanna, but you better let me know. I don't need to play the good licks if I ain't gonna be no show I'm better off sleeping with my guitar If you ain't gonna sing Strap to the body Making love to the strings We're back live here on BET tonight. I'm Tavis Smiley. He is the artist. There you saw the latest video from the artist. Come on. You may I hope you picked up on the fact that was the artist dressed up in that little old man outfit. No, was it? That wasn't you? No. That was not you hiding that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Sure it was. <laughs> Let me <laughs> sure it wasn't, I should say. Speaking of that outfit, mm -hmm. you last week got, speaking of play hate, got dogged, if I can say so, in the New York Post on page six because you wore an outfit similar to that on stage at the GQ Awards when you presented Chris Rock, the comedian, with an award. And I don't have time to read what they said about you, but it starts out by saying, this, believe it or not, is a, is a picture of you mm -hmm. in the paper. This, believe it or not, pictured above, is the weirdo 
still known as Prince. Well, there you go. And they go on there to dog you, you about go. this yeah, outfit. There you go. They, they had, apparently they hadn't seen the video and didn't understand what the synergy. You were upset about this? No, absolutely not. Yeah. You know, that they draw that type of energy towards themselves when they make such comments. Right. You know, I, 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 I never respond to a mentality like that. It's, it's, it's useless. People have always been obsessed. I mean, from day one. And I wish I had time to like just roll out a whole stack of photos here of how your image and how your look has changed over the years. People have always been obsessed with the way you look, with your style, uh, with your appearance. Why do you think that is, number one? And tell me honestly whether or not you play into that, you take advantage of that, and you tease people, and you, you play on that. It's Some, not obsession with your image. Sometimes I do, I, but, but I, I think they are vicariously living through these image changes, you know. At, at the heart of the matter, though, is the music. You know, I, I am a musician. Um, I don't sample, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it's not Memorex. I go on stage and my microphone is on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what, speaking of sampling, what, what do you think of sampling? It does, it's, it's not for you, but what do you think about other people who do it because everybody other than you practically is doing it? Uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't know what to say mm -hmm. uh, uh, about it. I, I can't have a real educated answer for that because I, because I play, I guess, you know. Uh, when you can sit and play, I want to take you higher for 45 minutes with the man who was in the studio when it was recorded, Larry Graham. I mean, wh wh why you want to sample something? That, <clears throat> you know, just for me, <clears throat> personally. Do you have any idea? I'm just totally, this is just total curiosity on my part. One of the great things about hosting a show is every now and then you can ask something that you just want to know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else wants to know this, but I am so curious as to how many, if you have any idea, how many unreleased songs, songs done, cut, unreleased, sitting around Paisley Park, NPG. How many songs do you have un unreleased? you have any idea? Um, I, I, I kind of don't like to speculate because it's upwards of a thousand, but... Uh, songs that are done, that could, that could in fact just... <clears throat> yeah, it's upwards of a thousand, excuse me. Um, I don't like to speculate because it makes me tired, it makes me realize that I actually am 40 years old, so... Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. The artist is 40 years old, he said it, not me. We'll talk about <laughs> how life changes when one turns 40 and when one gets happily married and hooked up with a beautiful young uh, wife like the artist has. And coming up later in this show tonight, Shaka Khan and Larry Graham are out there. They're going to come in here and they're going to join this conversation. You're watching a special 90-minute <clears throat> version of BET Tonight. See, I'm all choked up because of this guy. We'll be back to continue our conversation with the artist in just a moment. Stay with us. By the artist, hopefully you are enjoying our exclusive conversation with him. But before we continue that conversation, let me tell you right quick, about our show next Monday, November the 2nd, another exclusive, our scheduled guest next Monday night, President William Jefferson Clinton. What? In his, yeah, in his what? first live interview since the grand jury testimony tapes were released. I see the artist is excited about that. Mm. That's on Monday, November 2nd at 11 p.m. Eastern, the President of the United States, our scheduled guest in an exclusive conversation. Hopefully you'll be here next Monday night. Well, don't miss tomorrow night and Thursday night, but Monday, the President of the United States. Now, back to the artist, formerly known as Prince, and your phone calls. Tawana in Maryland, I thank you for holding. You're on the air. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not even going to try to put into words how big an admirer I am of, well, I don't call him the artist, I call him the genius. So I'll just go ahead and just ask my question. Um, my question is, this interview is basically live and, and not taped. So what made you decide to come on to this particular show and do such a personal one-on-one -on -one interview that's not in a controlled setting? I mean, Tavis, is, Ta Travis, Tavis isn't even playing around, so what would make you come on out and do a uncontrolled like interview like this? Well, thank you for your compliments, first of all. Uh, I, I just wanted to, um, as we approach 1999, I've just been doing a lot of thinking about how uh, people of color have been left out of the space program. Uh, they don't really see us in Pleasantville, uh, and uh, y you Ouch. know. I, and I, I also, Ouch. I also, I, I, I think a lot about something that is going to unite us all. We have to find out what that is because you know, if Jesus came down here, uh, we'd probably not recognize him. And I, I think it's um, important that we all unite for something now. And uh, I just wanted to come on and talk about 
uh, maybe that could be freedom. You know? I'm glad you came on to talk about it. Yeah. Tawana, I thank you. Teresa in Delaware, you've been kind to hold you on the air at the artist, and I'm glad you called. Yes, how you doing, Travis and uh, the artist? Yeah. I want to say that, Prince, I think you are so fine. But my question is to you, how come you don't have any concerts in um, small towns? And how come you're so private where um, the public cannot get a hold of you to, as far as like writing you letters or getting anything or more information o about you? Um, the, my first experience with... Um, uh, a fan, and I call her a fan because she was uh, pretty fanatical. Um, I used to answer her fan letters all the time, and she became very attached to me. And next thing you know, she was at my door, and um, she didn't want to leave. I've had people come up to uh, my porch and uh, try to get in, break in, all kinds of strange things. So I've uh, been pretty private. Uh, since these events. Uh, as far as playing concerts in smaller towns are concerned, we're, we have a lot of uh, plans for doing concerts from now until I can't jump off pianos no more. You know, I was on stage recently and I said that um, uh, people asked me what it felt like to be 40. I said, I don't know because I'm 17. Yeah. And still jumping off pianos. I'm gonna still jump off the pianos. Sharon in Maryland, thanks for holding you on with the artist and I'm glad you called. Good evening, artist. Good evening. I would like to know uh, where you will be performing for New Year's 1999, and will it be televised? Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully I'll be in the light. That's all I really want to say about that. L let me ask you, in the time I have left before we go to the top of the hour, stick by, stand by, I should say, Shaka Khan and Larry Graham coming up in just a minute here. I got one, one minute here, artist. Um, I don't know if I have time to even ask this and get started. As you look back on the song 1999, when you wrote it, and where we are now on the verge of 1999, any quick thoughts that come to mind? Yes, um, if the sky has blood in it, blue and red make purple. We'll ponder that during this commercial break and come back and continue our conversation with the artist formerly known as Prince. And in just a moment, we're joined by Chaka Khan and Larry Graham. Stay with us, you're watching BET tonight on Black Entertainment Television, and we're back in just a moment. Welcome back to the program. This is BET Tonight. I am Tavis Smiley. Normally we are off the air, but tonight a special 90-minute version. It's a big show squeezed into a small bag. We had to do that because we have tonight not just the artist, formerly known as Prince, but two of the other artists, legends in their own right, on the NPG Records label. Pleased to be joined now by, she's all that, on a bag of chips, Chaka Khan. And the legendary Larry Graham. Nice to see you both. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for coming on. I'm first of all cracking up because I have, I, we have all heard a thousand and one stories about artists who get together, go on tour, and they're not speaking after the third date, let alone after the tour is over with. And the three of y'all still appear to like each other. That's a lot of love. Are, are agree to come on television together. You're still speaking to one another. A lot of love. Let me start with you, Shock, and ask you. First of all, thanks for coming on. Oh, my you pleasure. You're a legend. Tavis. It's nice Thank to have you, you on. L let me start by asking you how you specifically, and I'll get Larry here a second, how you came to be in this association with the artists. You were also at Warner Brothers Records. Right. You left. Tell me your story about why you decided to do this. Well, actually, the artist is instrumental in um, helping me to leave Warner, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, if not in his coaxing, then in offering um, some of his um, his legal staff to help me mm -hmm. to get freed up. Um, then once uh, the seed was planted, you know, it was just a matter of time before everything just snowballed into what it's become right now. Um, soon after that, within months, I was free, and uh, and uh, then we were in the studio working on a CD. You heard us talking earlier, you heard the artist most, more specifically talking mm -hmm. earlier about freedom, and I noticed that you used the word freedom as well. Mm -hmm. what, what aspect of freedom, what, what, what about the freedom do you most appreciate? I mean, compare for me being at Warner and being at NPG and owning your own stuff and making, I mean, is it, is it about making more money? Talk, talk to me about well, those the differences. Thing, the, the, the thing I'm, I'm referring to is a, it's a, a very fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. It, it deals with the, the very essence of what you are. And when that is hampered with or affected in any way, the thing that you use to express yourself and to convey your thoughts and feelings to other people through a talent or some God-given phenomenon that you possess, when that's hampered or dealt with in any, any way, then you are, you are totally 
messed up all over. It affects every part of you in every way. So, I mean, just to be able, just the thought and the knowledge that I can go into a studio and sing any song I wish. Okay. Hold that thought. I hate to cut you off. I'm obliged to take a quick break right here. We got to do this, pay these bills. We'll yeah. come back and continue our conversation with Shaka Khan, Larry Graham, and the artist. We're back. BET tonight. I'm Tavis Smiley. A little old school there for you. She still looks just as good, and more importantly, she still sounds just as good. She is Shaka Khan, joined tonight by her along with the artist formerly known as Prince and Larry Graham, legend in his own right. We heard, uh, you heard us talking to Shaka earlier about how she ended up with this relationship with, uh, with the artist. I know you guys have been friends for quite a while, uh, and yet after all these years, the two of you now in this synergistic sort of way come together. Tell me why and how for you this process came to be. Well, I was on a tour. Um, I did the Aruba show with Sinbad, mm -hmm. and um, then that was followed by a tour, Earth, Wind & Fire, and uh, Graham Central Station, and Tina Marie, and so forth. And we were playing in Tennessee at the uh, amphitheater, mm -hmm. and my baby brother here was playing at the big venue, and I got this phone call at the hotel, hey, there's going to be an after show tonight, you know, after party, and we're going to jam. You want to come down and jam with us? It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that was really the first time we got a chance to uh, connect on stage and really um, s speak from heart to heart with our instruments uh, that night. Said a whole lot of hello and mm -hmm. hey, how you been okay. doing? Right. Oh, everything's been going fine mm -hmm. and all that. We said all that with our music uh, and also carving out what we wanted to do uh, for the future. It was all It was all taking place right there on stage. This guy, the artist, was bragging earlier about the fact that you all don't have in con you don't have a contract, you don't believe well, in contracts. What did say? Yeah, <laughs> and, and, exactly. And he, said, and he said that you would say that, and, yeah. and indeed you just said it. What would it say? I'm uh, wondering, though, whether or not, I'm wondering though, whether or not you, by the argument that I tried to offer to the artist earlier that he rejected, that people don't enter into relationships expecting them to go sour, but what do you do when it does go sour? Don't you want to protect yourself? Well, um, I, I see your side, you know, how you I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm not pushing this. Yeah. I'm just asking. But our relationship that we have is different than, than any other. And um, I love the re relationship that we have, and our relationship musically is built on love. Um, with my wife, I love my wife. It would be kind of strange if there had to be this contract <laughs> in the beginning of our relationship, if right. this or if that, and you know, all this doubt and all that put into it in the beginning, our relationship would be a lot different. You know, mm -hmm. musically speaking, there's so much love in what we do, and what we do comes from the heart, especially mm -hmm. music. If we put all this negative doubt out there, what if this and what if that? I'm telling you that, you know, I don't really right. trust you. Right. And mm -hmm. you're telling me, uh, I don't really trust you either. And yeah. so let's get my lawyer to see how I can protect me against you and you against me. And next thing you know, it's like it's, you know, it's affecting the music, it's affecting the it's relationship. It's the very thing, too, that we've been victimized by, too. And most, a lot of artists are victimized mm -hmm. by that same Mentality. contractually and dis mistrustful. Yeah, I actually think the contract is what makes the relationship go sour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost um, the nail in the coffin. You raised the issue earlier, Shaka, about creativity, and I want to come back to that because I thought you were onto something. I want to kind of explore this a little further with the three of you. You, you I, I thought I heard you start to make the point that when an artist feels that his or her creativity is stifled, mm -hmm. when they're under the gun, when they don't have the budget they need, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. but it's basically when that creative process is being infringed upon, mm -hmm. it makes you feel something, and you didn't really complete that thought. What happens in that? Well, it, place. I was. It's a very bad place to be. Uh, um, you one loses interest. I was. I was starting to actually like to lose interest in, in what I was doing. I didn't have the lust or the love, for it anymore. Certain aspects of my, of my, um, of, of my career became a, a, a gig, a job, mm -hmm. and that's what you, I, you. You. That's the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. When that happens, you know, I may as well go get a bank a job at the post office or the bank when if that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was like a cancer that was kind of growing, a sort of an emotional cancer. And I tell you, the floodgates opened when we got in studio. We started working, stuff came out. I was, I, I, there were a couple of days I was in tears. <laughs> there were some tears and it was like a major floodgate of stuff that was just. And, and, and mind you, let me just say this, you know, cover or no cover, I got much love for Vibe. Mm -hmm. They finally, I finally saw a review of our work that best typified what we believe. They said, um, uh, what do they say? Uh, uh, 
certified masterpiece. You know, when I'm, rec how are you gonna miss? Mm -hmm. and, and she made a good point about, she started to lose interest. This is how we lose artists, right? And we should save artists, and I, I challenge people to take care of her, you know? This isn't about money for me, yeah. I, I'm paid, you know? Yeah. I, I don't have to do this for money. I do this for my love of her, because I don't want to see her get lost, you understand? Yeah. So I challenge, uh, I challenge the radio stations, I challenge the record stores to take care of her. That's almost our obligation music is is, is our enlightenment all as, of us as the head of mpg artists let, let me ask you a couple of questions in that regard one about distribution and the other about your clientele your your, your roster of performers mm -hmm. i'm wondering first of all let me start with the with the, with the, with the roster you, you heard we, you recall earlier in the show we were talking about what some of the critics were saying about you that you're mm -hmm. losing your cutting edge and we discussed this already and moving toward that r&b legends tour mm -hmm. i'm wondering how it is that you chose of all the folk you can work with and i know there are a lot of folk would love to work with you. How did you choose these artists, Shaka Khan and Larry Graham? Well, first of all, uh, let me deal with the, the, the head of NPG mm -hmm. situation. Shaka is the head of Shaka, right. right? I can't be the head of her. She was my director on this project. She told me what to do. I was a hired hand, hired by love, mm -hmm. all right? Um, and as far as um, uh, uh, why I chose her, we should probably ask Erica Badu. You know, mm -hmm. sh she would choose Shaka too. You understand? Mm -hmm. We we want to work with the best, and uh, uh, Shaka was in a situation where she wasn't happy. There wasn't much coaxing that needed to be needed to be done. You know, I, I say to her very simply. Um, how do you want to make a record? She says, I want to fully realize my vision. All right, well, you can do that over here. And she, see, this doesn't negate her uh, going back and doing deals with record companies, even Warner's. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I think the record companies have to respect the art first and let that be the genesis of all decisions made. Exactly. Let, me, let me raise this question of distribution. You know as well as I do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. You can have the best product, you can have the best performers, um, out there. Ultimately, it is that distribution that gets you paid. Yes. If you've got stuff and you can't get it delivered, if you've got stuff and people can't buy it, it doesn't mean anything. Hello? What, wh how do you envision putting together a distribution channel when you're not with one of the big boys anymore like Warners to get your stuff in the streets? Okay, this is in the infant stages right now and uh, it's growing as we speak. Um, for example, Crystal Ball sold uh, upwards of 200,000 copies at $50 a pop. You can do the, ma the math and you can I see did, I did the math, you, oh. you, you got paid. <laughs> yeah, you got, <laughs> you got paid a little bit, I did the math. All right, all right. well, <clears throat> that's all I'm saying. 200,000 copies in, by industry standards would be a failure. But when you take the lion's share of the profit, what happens is, you know, mm. it, it's, it's really simple. You know, it's really simple. And, and like I say, I can, I'll say it over and over again, I don't negate the other way of doing business. This is just an alternative. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And as far as distribution goes, being in a situation like this, you can distribute your music all kinds of different ways. We sell them at the gigs, we sell them over the internet, and by the way, uh, uh, people of color need to get online. We are left behind right. again, right. once again. Uh, we, we sell them through um, Best Buy, Blockbuster, HMV. A lot of stores have been really cool with us, you know. And I mean, how do you not stock her record? You know, you understand what I'm I saying? Feel you. I feel you. you ask any of the current artists today, which we have much respect for, the Lauren Hills and the Erica Badu's and what have you, they got much love for her, you know? So it's, it's our obligation. And, and as a musician, this is Michael Jordan on the bass. Hello. Right? No question and, about that. Hello. And that's, <laughs> you know, the, open and shut the book. Right. Now, how do you not stop that if you love music? So I challenge radio, I challenge record stores to take care of uh, these people. I got a break, we'll come back and get phone calls for the artists, Shaka Khan and Larry Graham. And we'll find out from the artist how much risk this new theory, this new process that he's trying out is putting him at and putting Shaka at and Larry Graham out. There's got to be some downside to this. It can't all be an upside. <laughs> we'll find out what the downside is in just a moment. We'll continue our conversation. <laughs> Stay with us. We're back in just a moment. <laughs> About the fact that there must be some risk to this. What you're doing in many respects is quite revolutionary. Breaking away from the big boys, doing your own thing, bringing artists with you from the big boys. Everybody in the music industry can't be happy about this. What personal risk to you and to these artists here do you think really exists? 
I, I, you know, I have a lot of friends in the music industry still, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we plan to do business in the future. It's, it, it's just an alternative. It's no big deal. But you don't, you don't see this. Maybe I'll answer You don't see this at all as risky in any sort of way. No, n well, certainly not on our end. I mean, yeah. this has just been a learning, um, loving experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I might add too that if I sold a hundred thousand of these at a company they'd say, oh, that was a flop. Mm -hmm. huh. And I'd probably be getting somewhere at 14, 15 cents a record. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. If I sell 100,000 of these right now, I get $700,000. Excuse me. Uh oh, all right. <laughs> Enough said. We'll take some phone calls. That kind of said it. That, that says it. Yeah. Janet in New Jersey, thanks for holding you on the air, and I'm glad you called. 700. Oh, my comment is for the artist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 14, and ever since I was really young, I remember being very mesmerized and fascinated by your music. And up until the age I am now, I've come to realize how much you have, in fact, influenced my life so far. I hope and, in a good way. <laughs> yes, and shown me um, what I can be if I just apply myself enough. That's and right. And basically my question is, how does it feel to know that you have such an impact on your audience, particularly your younger audience? Uh, makes me feel very grateful to be alive. And uh, all I can tell you is Jesus is far more important. I've stopped signing autographs when I changed my name. So anybody out there, please don't ask. It ain't about that. Um, uh, we all need to unite for a, a reason now. We need to welcome Jesus' return. And if, if, if we can focus on that, all of us, uh, I think a, a, a lot of this uh, chaos will cease. Well, I guess I can throw this magazine cover away. I would not be getting it signed tonight <laughs> by the artist Rashida in D.C. Thanks for holding you on the air, and I'm glad you called. Uh, good evening, Tavis, Shaka. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd just like to say, God, please bear with me because I am trying to be calm. Take your time. I just want to say how big an influence you have been on me to the artist. And um, your music, like you said before, it's not music, it's a trip. And it takes, I think, a little bit of brains to get into it. Yes, and um, not just the funk, but the beauty, like a question of you and Curious Child and mm -hmm. uh, Power Fantastic. I mean, the beauty, the broad spectrum. But that's just my homage, and I'll get to my question now. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, how do you feel about um, the ticket brokers and the people who um, buy mass tickets and the real fans cannot get, you know, up close without paying 200 300 you know, dollars in order just to get a good look? Well, you know, we didn't, we didn't create this system. Artists didn't create the system of ticket selling. Uh, simple fact that um, um, they'll tack $8 on... Um, extra. Yeah, extra um, just to see you is, I mean, well, <laughs> listen, it's, it's one thing at a time and hopefully we can work on that too. Um, I just wanted to say something. I find uh, a lot of people that meet me, uh, um, um, I, I feel a lot of love that comes forth and uh, a lot of them do cry, you know, and, and, and it's almost as though I think that they just want to be known and they want me to know them. Uh, we, I think we all want to be known in some respect. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's kind of what we're into right now. Shaka's allowed to fully realize her vision. And I think my music, I always had creative control, which I ultimately thank Warner Brothers for. Mm -hmm. They allowed me creative control. I don't own the master tapes, but I w had creative control to create them. She did not. Larry did not. Larry had a guy that was working on his music. His name was Title Man. <laughs> all right, you deal with all of that. All right, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think my music has connected s so much because I've had the chance to fully realize my vision. That's what MPG stands for. It's not a record company. It's there's no risk involved. Let me let me change gears right quick and dramatically before my time runs out. I've only got a few minutes left in this show, unfortunately, because I could do this for another thirty minutes. There are rumors all over the internet, as you well know, artists, that you uh, Prince and the Revolution. That is. Mm -hmm. Uh, may get back together next year for a reunion album, a reunion tour. Mm -hmm. This sister was asking about ticket sales. It kind of made me think about that. What do you think? 
Yeah, I, I'm working on music that I recorded with the Revolution. I don't see a reunion happening. I mean, they're free to come jam with us anytime they want to. Uh, Rosie Gaines just came back and did some stuff sure with did. us. Um, <laughs> Sheila E's expected to come out soon. Uh, Candy Dulfer, who used to play with me, she came out and did some dates. I mean, it's just it's just a really fun-loving circus out there, it and is. it's never going to stop. You know? Tony in New Jersey, I got time for a quick comment. You're on the air. Yes, the artist, did you ever learn how to swim? Do you still play basketball? Thank you for the towel in Philly. Chaka Khan, are you still making chocolate? And Larry Graham, I challenge you to one thing. What's the difference in nationality, your birthright, and color? The difference in my nationality? Yeah, I mean, we. I have information for you. You guys are on the correct path. There are things I know and things you obviously all know, especially when it comes to freedom. Mm-hmm. I'm free. Good. Now, my question to you is, I'm sovereign. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you, the artist especially? I've followed you for so many years. I hear your journey, and I know where you're going, and I wish I could get things that I have to you, and you to I. Mm. Well, okay. sovereign to me, uh, of course, is God. And he, uh, of course, has the right to tell us what to do. We live by his standards. And uh, Jehovah sets the standards by which we live. Um, and then that filters on down to us. And then we try to the best of our ability to live up to those standards. Uh, granted, no one is perfect and we make mistakes. And that's why he let us know that uh, he gave his only begotten son so that we can get forgiveness when we mess up. And we just try to do it again better the next time. So that's what I get from uh, sovereign, uh, being obedient to God. I have one minute, literally, artist. I'm sorry, only one minute left in the show. I want to give you 30 seconds of that to tell me what the message of all of this is. Mom, I think Larry Best said it. You know, we got to unite for something. And as you see the three of us sitting here, we have no contract with one another. We've used love as our relationship, as the basis for it. And thus, we are successful. I want to thank you, the thank artist. You. Shaka Khan, thank you. Larry Graham, legends in their own right for thank coming you. on. Put, pick put that up there. Put that up there. New CD now. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate yeah. it. We're out of time. Thanks for watching this exclusive conversation GCS with this expert GCS audience and panel. Thank you GCS. for being here. I'll talk to you tomorrow night. Until then, thanks for watching. And as always, <laughs> keep the faith. It's hard for me to believe that this is 25 years of, of, of making music, and this album in particular, um, one song, Cinnamon Girl, looks at exploitation, and I just want to go over the lyrics for a moment. You say, Cinnamon Girl of mixed heritage, never knew the meaning of color lines. 9-11 turned that around when she got accused of this crime. So began the mass illusion, war on terror alibi. What's the use when the god of confusion keeps on telling the same lie? Why is that important for you to address some of the issues that we're facing today? Well, it seems to be the age-old uh, problem of prejudice and misunderstanding between so-called races. I mean, I wrote a song once about a large ball, black on one side and white on the other, and if you have a person about this big only seeing that one side, that's the way they think the world is. And unfortunately, in war, there's children dying on both sides. Uh, a child dying is a child dying. I mean, we really need to look at this and think seriously about what we're doing here. Hmm. You started making music in a pre-9-11 world, and you continue on in a post-9-11 world. Is, is it important to you to use your music to educate, and, and is that why you draw on current events for some of your music? Um, well, I think music, um, not only sh should it be entertaining, but it should try to uplift you in some form or fashion. I mean, I think that's the purpose of music. It's to make light of a otherwise dire situation. You know, you take music out of the world, it's going to be pretty uh, dark. You um, talk about, we just mentioned racism, exploitation, politics, sort of the, the ills of society, if you will. Um, how much of your own experience as an African-American is, is embedded in the lyrics of your music? Um, I almost think that we were taught race. It wasn't something that we're just born with. We all look different, 
we are all uh, varied in our complexions and sizes and you know all that's wonderful that's good you know but when we are um, put in boxes um, I've always railed against that I, uh, so this isn't a new topic for me could you picture the prints that I see now in front of me in 2004 could you see this 25 years ago when you were singing songs with some pretty um, explicit lyrics and uh, did you ever foresee this change in you well, this this maturity this this evolution well I always challenge people to play one of my so-called explicit songs up against an explicit song of today I mean if you take some of the uh, music off these songs of today you've got straight pornography and one thing um, I always tried to keep was sensuality in my music. It was never done in a spirit of uh, uh, misogyny or, uh, or meanness. You're definitely not a misogynist because you tend to employ female musicians in your band, mm -hmm. right? Why? That's a good question. They're the, the better sex? <laughs> watch it now, watch it now. <laughs> That's right, you can admit that to me because oh, I'm a go. female. Here we go. Uh, See, you threw me off there. <laughs> uh, female musicians, I, I think, tend to listen better, and they don't um, let their ego get in the way of music. Females play better with others. That's they what... listen better. <laughs> Come on now. I was in college when I became a devoted Prince fan. My buddies and I party. Like it's 1999. Dreamed of. And watch the skies for. So it was pretty unbelievable when Prince invited me to go on stage with the band. I mean, come on, what would you have done? I would have really gotten funky if the camera hadn't been rolling. But anyway, Prince wraps up the East Coast part of his uh, sold-out tour tonight in New York. The rest of his U.S. tour continues throughout September. The drumsticks from the band. Now here's Harry. All right. Strangely beautiful, beautiful, strange. That's what we say instead of name. Oh, name. You come the time you took all the blame. You would find the reason behind the game. Beautiful strength. Yeah. Yeah. All right, tell him I'll be right there. What do you want me to refer to you as? You have a million names, I heard. <laughs> a million names? Mm -hmm. Well, call me Melanie. Melanie. Because a lot of people, they call me Mel B or Mel or Scary. But people I like, I like them to call me Melanie. Well, after this airs, everyone will call you Melanie. Nobody else is allowed to call me Melanie. <laughs> Only me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what about you? What do I call you? Well, I go by an unpronounceable symbol, but you can call me Spud. Spud? As in potato spud? Or just Spud? Just Spud. Spud. Does it stand for anything? Mm hmm What? You know. Do I? Mm hmm I can't believe 
think. <laughs> I want to know why me? Why have you chosen me to interview you? Because you're a pimp. Look at this watch. <laughs> He's calling me a pimp. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm admitting it. Can you believe it? I'm actually admitting it. But yeah, you know, I followed your stuff. And you're going to be going on tour soon, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. And you've got your album out already. Tell me, tell me a bit about that. The album? Yeah. Uh, with the New Power Generation, it's called New Power Soul. All right. It's a um, spiritually political record. Oh, you said that earlier. What do you mean by spiritually political? Um, we're getting closer and closer to the truth on the album. Good. So who influenced you on this album that you have out now? This one actually was influenced by the musicians that are on it, the New Power Generation. Uh, I change uh, musicians every two, three years or so. This will probably be the last band that I have for a while. I'm going to do some solo work after this. But this record is um, it's, it's one of the maddest records I ever got hooked up with. Freaks on this side and push it up and all that. A lot had to do with the energy that we uh, experienced on the live shows we try to get into the album. It's fun being in a situation where we don't worry about charts and singles yeah, and videos and all that now because it really does affect how you go into the studio, what it is you put down uh, on the tape. It's a brilliant album. It is. Properly has got that. <laughs> that thing, I can't explain it. That thing, you know, that kind of... That's probably you want to play all it loud. best left unexplained. <laughs> all, of, all of it. <laughs> And what's the show going to be like? Tell us a bit about that. Oh, it's going to be sick. It's going to be so sick. You've got dancers, you've got your band. Yeah, it's going to be so sick, so long, just... Jamming. Funk. Yeah, funk ridden. Larry Graham is coming with us. Chaka Khan. And Dougie Fresh. All right. It's going to be crazy. Brilliant. Looking forward to that. Mad sex. <laughs> but one thing that you started to do was sell your albums on the internet. Why, why was that? Uh, I like the uh, interaction between fans, the direct line. Uh, friends, I don't like to call them fans, that's short for a fanatic. All oh, right, yeah. Because I was having a word with my drummer, got a drummer on tour with us, and he goes, at some point there's going to be no need for record companies, everything is going to be done through the internet. You're well, going to be able to sell, download, everything is going to be through the internet. Do you, do you think that? Or? Well, I'm not so sure about that. Um, you know, record companies have their uh, purpose. Um, they're actually good for people who are just starting out and yeah. need a helping hand. And uh, They, they um, serve a lot of functions, you know. But for somebody like me who writes a lot and records a lot and wants to release a lot, it's a detriment. So I stepped away. It doesn't negate going back and, and, you know, doing something in the future. Because you've got your own label now, haven't you? Well, it's three letters, NPG, that we stamp on the product. But right. um, we're, we're musicians. We don't need to function as a record company, per se. Oh, right. So you do yeah. more kind of yeah. on a level. Yeah, and, and I don't wear a suit. So. No, that's good. So if I release some stuff, then I could go under your label, couldn't I? Mm. If I talked to you enough around it. This, as long as you own your work, it's cool, because that's what New Power Generation Yeah, that's what New Power Generation is about, uh, ownership of the master, or else you're a slave. I really respect that, how you've done things, because you're your own person, Thanks. and you do what you want to do, and you kind of control a lot of things around you, which is very important, obviously, for you, and to get on working, but does that, like, do you not feel strained by that, or does that... Well, um, more so than control, I think I'm trying to let things evolve on their own, especially the music. Well, where do you get all this inspiration to do so much writing, so much music, to produce so many albums at such a good quality? Where do you get all that from? My gift comes from God. Yeah. Um, so you reckon you were put here to do music? To yeah, to give back onto that gift, to, to stop recording, to to put a cap on your work and then put a boundary on it. it. Actually, for me, is to put a boundary on your gift that comes from God, and I can't do that. I write so much because I, uh, it is therapy for me. You're evolving your spirit, actually, every time you go back into the well and examine Better things. yourself. Yeah, so 
the more I write, the more stuff I put out, the quicker I get to my destination. So do you think, so is your, your music is a soundtrack to your life, to your to my psyche. growing up? Yeah, I would think so, yeah. Wow. <laughs> On birthdays, you don't like birthdays? No. No, not into that? No. Um, we came here not knowing that we were going to die. Somebody told us that. Right, and if we never knew we were going to die, we wouldn't celebrate a birthday, because we... But isn't it nice to celebrate the day you was born? And I'll celebrate the day I die. Oh, because you're going to move on to the next path in life? Yes. Who influenced you? Uh, Larry Graham, Shaka Khan. You've done, you've done a few performances with Shaka Khan, haven't you? Yeah. She's she just uh, finished a record with us, and we helped her with. She's a hard boss, but Good. I like working for her. Good stuff, King. So what influenced you, um, your singing style, your dancing style? You know you did. Your it was writing you. style. No, no, no. I was a dancer. This is like, you know, not a club dancer, but I was like Blackpool summer season dancer. Oh, I see. That's how I actually started getting interested in the music industry and things like that. Because you started in, in the music industry when you was about 15, didn't you? Um, actually, uh, 12. 12? Wow. Yeah. Not, um, not the professional side of it, but, um, I got my first band then and started getting, uh, getting, uh, payment and snicker bars. Snicker bars? Yeah. <laughs> Why snicker bars? So we exchanged money back then. It was currency. Candy was currency. Back then. You can't sit still to your music. You have to get up and you either have to stamp your foot or you have to do something. And I like that about music. That's what music sh should make you feel. Mm. Like, I know there's a lot of music out there that is kind of makes you depressed and you kind of put on the thing and you want a mm. bit of a cry. Whereas your music, it gets you, but in, in a good way. And I think that's what music should always do. I think it should uplift. <laughs> Yeah. There's enough things to bring you down. We don't need to jack our music up that way, too. I mean, there's, you, there's still a way to um, get anger and uh, even hate across sometimes in music. But um, you have to resolve it. You have to show that it's useless to hold these ideas. There's a lot in the music. I, I'm, uh, interviews are... Uh, this is cool because you and I are just hanging out talking. Yeah. In most interviews, they ask you questions. Um, I find now people are trying to get me to say something ill about record companies all the time. I have no, oh, right. I have no yeah. bad feelings about record companies. I love record companies. They work. It is very obvious that they work uh, by, the, by the consolidation of power. So um, uh, I'm just doing something else right now. So, and, and by being free and doing something else, it almost... Um, wakes you up to the fact that let, let them do their thing, you do your thing. Nobody's bothering me now, it's cool. But it's good you said you realise that because people, you know, they do want to kind of criticise or they do want to drag some badness like he said this to make like a good headline, but it's good that you don't rise to it. You yeah, know, we, your opinion and that's that. Yeah, I, I, I don't look at myself through other people's eyes. I had an interesting discussion with Larry Graham and uh, a journalist upstairs about criticism of music you know if you're a true artist you're using the gift you've been given from God yeah. and um, to uh, criticize a gift from God is sort of to criticize God yeah. now y you can cut that any way you want but <laughs> it's the truth so yeah. y you know I looked at the writer I said I wouldn't criticize your writing here I'm not a writer I don't write books you know I wouldn't but the media is, I think, it's all a ball of all kinds of things. They get it wrong. They do get it wrong, but they just stir up people's attention. And well, think, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be cooler to just tell people about things that you like and things exactly, you think have yeah. merit? Um, spending your, your life just criticizing another man's work and his gift is... Such but I think it's, sometimes it's easier for people to dwell on negative things rather than to look at the positive things because what you've done for a lot of people is you've influenced them, you've got, I mean you influenced me a, a lot, really, you really have done. I hope in a good way. You have. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs>
Okay, you're, you're not a pimp then. <laughs> no, I'm not. I might have a pimp watch, oh, but okay. you know. Okay, now 1999, there's you had a song. Let's talk about this watch though. <laughs> no, I want to talk about the song. <laughs> the song 1999. I just asked him, right, if he will do 1999. I asked you. I'm looking at you now. Right? Mm -hmm. And you said. I said that you could do 1999 if I could redo Wannabe. Right. Which means? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, well, you, you can do anything you want. You're free to. Many okay. people have redone my songs. I find that they're doing them more now than ever. Now and are you now. flattered by that? Do you feel? What do you feel about <clears throat> that? Well, I, you know, if it's genuine and it comes from the uh, artist's heart, then I'm cool with it. If they're being egged on by their management and their record companies... Then you say no. Well, that's, that's not genuine. That's just trying to get another piece of... The action. The purple pie, yeah. I like you. You're, this is the best interview I've ever had. <laughs> You're just saying that. <laughs> no. You're very complimentary. No, I, I, I respect you a lot. And that's I think the there's a lot thing. of people out there... The highest thing you can pay people. It's much greater than money. It's a compliment. I appreciate it. All right, shall we do this game? What game? This game, you know, I told you about it earlier. Oh, oh okay. I ask you ten things, right? <laughs> then I tell you the first thing that comes to mind. It's going to be just one word, so you can answer it in a sentence, or you can answer it in one word, or you can say pass. Right. First thing, cars. Corvettes. Jewelry. Jew. Time. Lie. Holidays. Holy days. Christmas. <laughs> Nimrod's birthday. What's that? Long story. Okay. Eyes. Soul. Underwear. Inconceivable. Food. Mighty. Music industry. Uh, owners. Sexuality. Spiritual. Animals. Uh, unconditional love. So I play it with you now. Go on then. Go on then. See, I too, because I wrote mine down for you, but you're just gonna put them out of the, pluck them out of the sky. Okay. Uh, spice. Spice. Lively. Cross. Cross. Mixed. When things go that way, they get kind of mixed up and you end up getting cross. You no need to get cross, really. Mm -hmm. Time. Time. There is no time, really. Mm. She says we're in a pimp watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, one more. One more. Not too hard. Love. Love. Forever, it should be. I like it as well because she's singing about, you know, sex. So I like that. I do not. <laughs> well, you know, you do. I do not. You do, like, as in, you know, the, you do. No, I don't. Well, what, what, what is it then? Well, mm. I see it as that. Maybe I'm, inter I'm interpreting it different. <laughs> I see it as that. Well, I don't want to ruin you, it for you. You, you tell me what it is Well, then, I don't so want to ruin it for you. No, go on, correct me, because oh, I like, it's you know, spiritual, to hear. It's spiritual union for me. So you were saying about the noise, the gold plants are on, it's all very calming. Mm. I like that, Is that that's, it must be important to you. Yeah. Then you can hear. Oh, you've got doves up there, haven't you? Yeah, they're quiet have you, now. Have you got names for them? Mm hmm What are they called? Majesty and Divinity. Yeah. Do you breed them? Uh, no, <laughs> no, not by no. choice. They just, we looked up and there were... Eggs shaking. <laughs> That's a very pure thing to have around. I've got a dove house. My doves are, I think, they, yeah, my doves are rare because they've got like a black tail. They don't look as pure and innocent as your doves. Hmm. And what does this, you've got a carpet up there with words on. Can you tell me what that says again? That's probably best left between us, though, what the words are. Okay. Say. I'm letting that a secret. <laughs> Lovely there. And you should go for a walk. Yeah. And leave all this lot behind.
your black limo? <laughs> Can I just say I didn't order that, all right? Uh, <laughs> that was not me. Any reason why it's that color? So nobody can see in, I guess. Hmm. Are you going to do any more movies? I'll do one with you. All right. What's going to be about? Who's going to write it? You. Me write it? Yeah. Why should I do a lot of writing? Whether it be good enough for a movie or not, I don't know. I'm being serious now, you know. Yeah, go for it. What does it have to be about? The truth, of course. You know, one, As one in what time. though? What kind? There's all kinds of truths in my little diary of things. There is only one truth. Which is? <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> don't, don't worry about your bum. Brothers like that. Uh. And you can go, why don't you say to me, Romeo, Romeo, let down your hair. <laughs> go on. <laughs> Please. For that fantasy of mine. Well, is that your hair? No, it's not. It's false, but <laughs> I can pretend. Oh, okay. Romeo, Romeo, let down your No, it's Rapunzel. Rapunzel, that's it. Rapunzel. I've had enough outside now. It's too hot. Oh, the sun's out now. I think you are lovely, you know. I do. I really do. I want to ask a question before you go about um, your reputation. Mm-hmm. Because you, you've been very cool, you've been very quiet. Yeah. And you're not scary at all. No. What's up with that? I think a lot of people, they like to pinpoint it because I am I have got my own, own opinion I do like to say exactly what I think and I think people are not ready for that sometimes it's like they'd rather have somebody safe and somebody quiet who will go yes 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 and agree to everything rather than somebody who's got their own opinion and their own set of morals their own ideas their own picture and I think for some people that's frightening <laughs> that's why they criticize you and make out as if you're something that you're not really you find that people live through you and then when you don't act like they expect you to, then... I don't know what you mean, actually. Then you're the bad one. Yeah. Melanie bad. <laughs> well, regardless of the watch you wear, and your black limo, you ain't so bad, you ain't so scary. No, I'm not. And I think you person. are lovely. Thanks. You are. I was saying earlier, a lot of people, they get the wrong impression of you, or they've written the wrong impression, or they speak of the wrong impression of you and that's their own ignorance they don't they should have a more open mind because i think you're yeah. lovely yeah get it from the horse's mouth <laughs> <laughs> Mom, <walk> into your car. <laughs> what was it that you were listening to in music today that made you say i've got to put some more stuff out there you have to do this uh, mainly, I sensed a great deal of uh, negativity and entropy in the music. There's, um, there's a disintegration going on that we really have to address. And our values have been lessened to a great degree. Uh, VH1's been pretty cool. They don't show too much craziness on their channel. But um, other Viacom channels do. So I, I think that we... We should address this as a community as to what it's doing to the culture. Uh, people can say all they want to, that there, there's no reason for these kids to listen to music and then go shoot somebody. But, you know, there's something that's triggering these buttons. Do you, do you feel responsible as an artist Very for much so. what you're putting? Do you think that other people do? Uh, no, I don't. You talk about music that's going out there right now. Um, are you talking about any particular type of music? that you don't think is such a positive influence? Well, it's very obvious when you hear words and lyrics, whether they enlighten or discourage. Okay, so hip-hop gets slammed a lot. Um, Marilyn Manson gets slammed, Corn gets slammed. A lot of those acts that are you know, out there putting, is, is that what we're talking about? Uh, it's not what I'm talking about. No? I'm just talking about the truth. Just general? Yeah. The truth is that you either are here to enlighten or discourage. Do you feel like 
you obviously, you know, you've grown a lot and you've changed um, since 1982 and, and the 80s when you were putting out music. But there were, you were always thought of as, as somebody who was putting out extremely sexual music. Mm -hmm. is, is that a problem to you or are you talking more about the profanity? Yes, yeah, sex, sexuality is not that no. I'm talking about. Sexuality is very spiritual in nature and that's a God-given gift too. No, I, I'm, I'm talking about just plain disintegration where you're not even speaking the truth anymore, you know, and the violent imagery that's permeated the society and our music now. Uh, and, and sampling is getting to the point where it's out of hand, too. I mean, you pretty soon we'll be sampling the sample <laughs> that was already sampled. Somebody was joking, saying Mariah Carey had sampled herself on the latest album, <laughs> you know. How do you measure your success? By, oh, who was the rapper? Uh, Master P said, only God can judge me. There it is, only God can judge me. All right. Good. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. with the artist formerly known as Prince. Do you know I have a nickname for you? Uh-oh. <laughs> you too, huh? Yeah, I do. Do you know what I call you? Mm. <laughs> Taft Cap. Uh-oh. See? The artist formerly known Thank as... Thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, your, your name now is the artist formerly known as Prince, because Prince is history, right? No, 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 no. no. This is my name. What's... I know. Simple. That's, that's my name. Get a symbol for a name. There's no pronunciation for it. And how'd you come up with that? Mm, prayer. Prayer, yeah. Mm. You weren't just doodling one day and you thought, that's it! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's changing. That's funny? <laughs> that's funny, that's funny. No, that's not funny at all. Did you think it was funny? No, oh, sorry. I take it back. It's a live show. We would have edited that. But, you know. Can I do that one? Yeah, you want to do the shooter? Just, okay, just here you go. I'll show you how to do the one. Now, no. you do it, hold it this way and make sure this part is on your wrist, okay? Let me have that launch here. I'll show him. All right. Here's your thing. Make sure this touches your wrist. There you go. One See more. that? Go ahead. Keep going there. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. Now, you see, you know what happens? If you put it up a little bit, Taffy, you get it. <laughs> Oh, we gonna go there, oh, huh? You know, Taffy's nice. Do oh. you like Cap better? I'll just call you Cap. You know what Taffy rhymes with, don't you? Taffy, Maffy, Swaffy, Haffy, <laughs> Paffy, Waff, Caffy. What does it rhyme with? It rhymes with good night. Good night? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I won't call you that anymore. Don't call me so listen, too. the thing is, um, I'll just point to it. Cool. Okay. How do you like married life? Congratulations love being it. married. You love it, right? It's a beautiful ring. And your wife, she, was, she works with you as well, correct? Um, she dances with you? She used to, not anymore. Not anymore, no. And you met at a, at a club, she came to see your show? No, no. <laughs> see what you read in the paper is not yeah. true, Prince. No. I mean, Mr. Art. Actually, that's better than Taffy. Lord it is. <laughs> oh, it is. I won't call you Taffy anymore. I would slip out, boom, throw it away, done. But d did she come to see your show? That's not how you met, though. Um, she came to a concert, yes. yes. And uh, I saw her... Um, standing on the street with her mother uh, and they were on their way into the concert and uh, I looked and I said, hey, there's my future wife. See, you just, just knew. Just as a, you know, as pa uh, in passing, you know, little did I know. Did you know, did you feel that right away that? Mm, when I met her, I did, but, you know, just, I was just being rambunctious. Yeah. Well, you seem very happy lately. I see you on all the shows. I saw you on Oprah. You were great. I saw you on the Today Show. Yeah. You seem very happy. Are you happy? Very happy. Yes. Yeah. And you look good. Mm -hmm. You're very <laughs> cute. Oh. Yeah. You are. Oh. You're very cute. I want to be cute. Now, your new CD is Emancipation. When we come back, will you do another song? Yes, ma'am. We'll be right back with the artist formerly known as Prince. <laughs> what do you feel like playing tonight? If you were to play something for us? Um, if I was to play something for you, uh, I'd be your accompanist and you'd, uh, you'd do your thing.
but I'm not a singer. Neither am I. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you look a little nervous. I right am now. nervous because uh, we just went through this during the during the commercial break, and Prince said that he would play a song if I were to sing, and I'm not a singer, uh, but, um, and I don't know a lot of the words to the songs, so. Would you want to play something for us? <laughs> <laughs> I'll play something for you. Okay. You 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 thinking about what you want to sing? <clears throat> How about Delirious? Go on. I'm blanking out with the words. You don't know any blues? Um, blues? I yeah. love, I have a jazz. Um. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to do this. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to do this. Okay. Um, how about how about one of one of your oldies? Since you're telling everybody that you're not going to be playing your oldies anymore, how about Purple Rain? I don't know that one. You do. You lie. Okay, you sing it. How could I even try? I'm sitting here with Prince. I'm gonna sing. <laughs> She's tearing up. <laughs> so that's not what the audience wants. <laughs> You're killing me. That's the idea. You are great, Prince. Thank well, you I so much. I'm sorry. I sh I, I wimped out. I'm just. I'm afraid because I don't have a voice. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> Sitting here with the genius of all of music, and you're asking me to sing. I gotta say one thing. I gotta, I gotta, there's only one way to start this. The first person to contact me when I came back to late night was this man to congratulate me and to say, he will be here, save me a night. Thank you, dude. You've always been a good friend. Thank you. Always. And, and here's the interesting thing Do you have a cell phone? <laughs> no. See, I'm always shocked when I hear from you. Uh, but how do you survive in this world without a cell phone? Everybody I know has one. Oh. <laughs> you are, you're in social media. You, you have an Instagram account, a Twitter account now. Um, I'm trying to get Prince to Graham. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, you actually, I saw a selfie of you, or, or it was yours, I should say. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, that, that was your first? Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> that was it. Uh, how, how, would, how would you, uh, y yeah. <laughs> what, what do we title that selfie? Um, one. Hey, <laughs> one, that's one. Uh, let's, let's talk about titles. Your favorite title in the Prince catalog, what's your favorite song? Mm turns you on every time you do it? I usually answer by saying the next one, mm. but there is a song that uh, we've just written uh, called The Breakdown. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's his, uh, yeah. kind of... <laughs> one of the things that we try to do, though, is wait until we have other songs that go together with our favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it takes a long time to come out with albums yeah. these days. Yes. Because, you know, not being under contract, there's no rush to do anything. If you want... They like that. They like you having your freedom, I think. If you weren't Prince, what would you do for a living, you know? I mean, because I know there was a point where you maybe thought about something else. What would you do? Well... Uh... I can't see you at the bank, you know? <laughs> Even though all the ladies would be in his line, you know. <laughs> um, when I was uh, 16, uh -huh. I was completely broke and needed to go get a job. So I got the yellow pages out and I couldn't find one thing that I wanted to do. So I decided I was going to push as hard as I could to be a musician and win at it, you know.
Do you watch any of the shows that bring new musicians to the American public? Not so much. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> I am. Um, You're talking about you know the, the Voice and uh, Idol, you know the whole genre. Yeah, I was I was watching a show with uh, Esperanza Spalding, who's mm -hmm. a friend of mine. Bass player. Uh, 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 and uh, she, we were both sitting there quiet. We were watching. And we looked at each other, and then she says, "Are you rearranging the music right now in your head?" <laughs> no. And then she said, "So am I." So it's really hard to watch other musicians because you tend to, you know, it's like a painting you want to make straight or whatever. You just hear music like you hear it. it doesn't mean that, you know, what they're doing isn't of merit. It's mm -hmm. just, I just hear music different. That's all. Now I've met, it seems like a hundred musicians today here with you. What do you look for in musicians <laughs> these days? Um, I was thinking about your question a second ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd want to teach in some capacity if I didn't. Uh, yeah. there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fine musicians in the group right now, and I'm learning from them. So as much as I'd like to teach, I also like to learn. Yeah. yeah. Um, is, there, is there a huge vault of material that you've created that we've never even heard? And, and how do you make oh, those no. choices? Because I'd like to hear everything that you pin. Yeah. You know, just, just to hear. You would look different when it was finished. Really? It <laughs> takes a long time. There's a lot of music down there. Yeah. Like, like how many songs? I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't go back in time and listen to it like that. I, did. I worked on it and brought it as far as I could right then. A lot of it I didn't even finish. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the bootlegs that are out right now, they are unfinished, unmixed. You know, sometimes they change lyrics. And again, you wait until, you know, you can find other things to go with it. Um, we live in a singles-driven market, but, you know, I come from the old school of making albums, and that's what I'll always do. You seem to have uh, somewhat of a, a love-hate battle going on with technology. Uh, I know you haven't always loved the internet. Uh, how are you seeing progress right now with all of that? Can you use it to your advantage? Um, it's a double-edged sword, you know. A lot of artists aren't getting paid full scale for their art and the internet, because of downloading and things like that, is kind of like a black hole and it's hard to audit, it's hard to get accounting, and it's not that it's just about the money, but it's about justice and fairness, and when people say that they love you and they respect you, but at the same time take, you know, 80% of your earnings, then, and then expect you to fix your own communities, and they'll probably edit all of this out, but... Then it gets, that's, that's the sharp part of the sword, and we're at the wrong end of it right now. So eventually, with courageous people going out there and actually saying something and standing up for it, I think we'll get some balance. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> we've watched you evolve over the years, not only as a musician, but as a man. And uh, I wonder sometimes when you look back at old material, like I've looked at so much in the last 24 hours to prepare for this, do you look back at old stuff, risque stuff, and, and want to separate yourself from it? Well, you know, when you're 20 years old, you're looking for the ledge. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to see how far you can uh, push everything. Mm -hmm. And um, as an artist, I just went there just to find it. And then you make changes. You know, 30 years ago, uh, there's a lot of things I don't do now that I did 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's some things I still do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Now, when you said that, the first thing I flashed back on is, gosh, he, he's such, he's Prince. I know that, I get all that. But he's, he's also like this, this, this normal brother you hang with. I remember a time, and if I have to take this out, you tell me I have to take this out. Uh, but I remember one time, we went down the way south of Wilshire to an after-hours spot and hung out and partied. 
that's something that mm -hmm. we'll probably. <laughs> <laughs> I can, you know, I, I mean, I, I have a son now, and, and, and uh, Congratulations. you put, Yes, sir, yes, sir. And uh, we were, there were so many things that, that, that we did back then. Remember that house? We were sitting in a house, and then. Vaguely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like they take you in, and they chain the door, and it's a pit bull, and uh, they give you a drink and a paper cup, and he wouldn't touch nothing. He, he just sat. Were we in somebody's kitchen or something? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. It was crazy. And Prince was sitting in this house. He wouldn't drink nothing. He wouldn't touch nothing. And he was trying not to breathe. He had a cane. <laughs> if, if he could have got oxygen out that cane, uh, uh. he could have stayed longer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, but just just normal good times as as as, as young brothers experiencing success. It's 1999, especially in The View today, because the artist, one of the most gifted and influential musical geniuses of our time, is back. His new CD is called Rave Unto the Joy Fantastic, and it is fresh and fanciful and full of all the feelings we need to usher in a new millennium. It's such an honor for me to welcome this man. He's a sexy, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, the artist. <laughs> We wouldn't gush too much, but I just just kick one credential that makes me absolutely incredulous. You are a master musician. You mastered 20 instruments by the age of 12 years old. And to, to even say that makes makes my and head. No one shake. moves like you. No one. at all. Um, and you played every instrument on the first five albums. Are there any instruments left to try to learn to play? Uh, with the advent of uh, synthesizers, you pretty much can uh, copy any sound on the planet. So I play keyboards pretty well. So I'm in there now. You in there? By the way, this is this show is wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to ask you uh, on your new album, uh, Raven to the Joy, fantastic. You credit Prince as the producer, yet you are known as the artist. So do you, is there anything that you want to specify here for us? Well, uh, most of these terms, the artist, the artist formerly known as this and that and the other, <laughs> all that's kind of made up by the media because uh, I go by an unpronounceable symbol. And basically now it's a, a great way to distinguish between the Warner Brother product, which is uh, Prince, and NPG product. Uh, there'll be a new uh, Greatest Hits package coming out that uh, will be released on MPG and... Uh, when Doves Cry, please tell me when Doves Cry will be oh, there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it'll be fully remastered and, you know, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-record re just about all my work. And um, uh, your hair looks better like this, by the way. Oh, thank you. You'd be better than straight? <laughs> well, yes. thank you. <laughs> I just really quickly, if it's too personal, just tell me, but can, can we know what your wife calls you? Does she call you Prince? Does she call you the artist? Uh, um, she used to just say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my stepfather's name is Hayward, so she stopped doing that because it sounded like my mom calling him by his nickname. So she just uh, basically sneaks up behind me and taps me on the shoulder or says honey or something like that, you know. Oh. You keep your private life very private, which is something that I admire. But I know that you're real proud of the spiritual connection to your wife. You were married, you did the civil thing, the marriage contract, and then you destroyed the contract 